Good morning. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, uh, Chair of the Committee on Aging. No, no clapping. <laughs> if you love what we say, just do this, okay? <laughs> well, welcome to the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on Aging. I am once again honored to be serving as chair of the Committee on Aging and excited to continue building on the accomplishment of the committee over the last four years. Today, we will hear testimony from the Department for the Aging, also referred to as DIFTA, on its proposed budget for fiscal year 2019. General agency operation within its proposed $344.1 million budget and performance indicators for aging services within the fiscal 2018 preliminary May mayor's management report. Seniors are the fastest growing segment of New York City's population. There are 1.6 million adults aged 60 and over in New York City, more than 19% of the city's residents. By 2030, the number of seniors will grow by nearly 50%, and one in every five New Yorkers will be a senior. Last year, I was proud to proclaim 2018, the year of the senior. And what a year it was. The council worked tirelessly with the administration to baseline nearly $23 million into DIFTA's budget, including $10 million to right-size senior centers budget, $6.5 million to address the home care wait list, $4 million for caregiver services, and $1.2 million each for senior case management and weekend meals. Overall, since fiscal year 2014, DIFTA's budget has grown by 26%. But we're not done yet. I believe that every year should be the year of the senior until all our seniors are living in dignity, security, and health. Yet DIFTA's fiscal year 2019 proposed budget is less than 1% of the city's total budget. It is my goal over the next four years to increase DIFTA's budget to at least 1% of the city's total budget we need to recognize that our seniors built New York's neighborhoods. They taught our children, maintained our buildings, drove our trains, and cared for us in times of need. They are just as important to the vibrancy of our city as our youth. And we have a responsibility to ensure seniors live out their golden years in dignity, security, and health. That is why I'm committed to making every year the year of the senior. The city must increase its investment for senior services and ensure that no seniors is on waiting lists for vital DIFTA programs such as case management and home care. The Department for the Aging's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget total approximately $344.1 million a decrease of 21.7 million, or 6%, when compared to the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. Nearly all of the decrease can be attributed to the absence of the one-time council funding for senior services in fiscal 2019. The council allocated 31.6 million to DIFTA in fiscal 2018, or 9% of the agency's overall fiscal 2018 budget. The majority of these council initiatives supported core DIFTA services that are inadequately funded, such as senior center services and programming, elder abuse support, quality social adult daycares, and naturally occurring retirement communities. At every budget meeting over the last four years, I have advocated that the administration baseline council funding for core services that DIFTA provides, instead of relying on council funding year over year to fill the gaps in the agency's budget. This year is no different, and I call on DIFTA to make this 
Year of the Seniors memorable by working with us to dramatically increase baseline funding for core DIFTA services. This fiscal year, I'm also calling for the administration to ensure that we have universal free lunch for seniors. We are a city must fight poverty and hunger that is so overlooked among our oldest elder population. Every senior center had the right to ask for donation to supplement food costs and additional programs. However, when seniors go to the centers for a delicious meal, oftentimes the first thing they see is a volunteer giving out tickets for the meal and simultaneously asking for a donation. The centers that rely on this funding to provide nutritious meal, it can be seen coercive and seniors on a tight budget should never feel coerced to pay for a needed meal. We must also need to add 10 million over two years to achieve a full 20 million model budget for senior centers. This will allow adequate funding for senior center space, transportation, programming, and staffing by fiscal 2021. It will also set the bar for the next neighborhood senior center RFP request for proposal, which I hope will include additional new needs to fund immigrant centers that the council currently support. Finally, I want to ensure that social adult daycares, in particular those not supported with city funding, are clean, regularly inspected, and not competing unfairly with our neighborhood senior centers. Um, before I invite the commissioner to testify, I'd like to thank the committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. We have Daniel Krupp, the finance analyst, Sohini Sapura, our unit head council, and council, Kaylin Fahey, and policy analyst, Emily Rooney. And uh, now we will have our council swear in the panel. And welcome, Commissioner Corrado. You raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer honestly to council members' questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Chin, members of the Aging Committee, our senior constituents. I am Donna Corrado, Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging, and I am joined this morning by Sasha Fishman, our Associate Commissioner for Budget and Fiscal Operations, and Fran Winter, Deputy Commissioner for Programs. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss DIFTA's preliminary budget for fiscal year 19. The fiscal year 19 preliminary budget projects 344 million in funding, which includes allocations of 147 million to support senior centers, 38 million for home delivered meals, 37 million for case management, 30 million to support home care for homebound seniors who are not Medicaid eligible, 7 million for NORC programs, and 8 million for caregiver services. The administration has made a major commitment to aging services, including an increase of more than 50% in baseline city tax levy funding between the last year of the prior administration and this fiscal year preliminary budget. That's an overall increase of 78 million in baseline funding. So we uh, listened and heeded your call for more baseline funding in the administration's budget. This increase benefits most of DIFTA's programs, including senior centers, elder abuse programs, caregiver and home care services. This year, the administration increased funding for home sharing by 1.4 million. This program matches adult guests in need of housing with homeowners or leaseholders with space to spare. This year's budget builds on the significant increases in last year's fiscal year 18, some of which includes the following. 7.3 million was provided to stabilize the staffing in case management programs. We are happy to report, as a result, retention of case management staff has increased. More competitive salaries have helped reduce high turnover rates, 
improved service delivery, and ensured continuity and quality of care. The vacancy rate has declined from 8% in January 2017 to about 4% in January 2018. More than one-third of all case management staff, or 38%, have held their positions for three years or, or longer. That's an infusion, through an infusion of 1.5 million, DIFTA-funded case management agencies hired 11 new case managers and six supervisors to address the case management wait list. 1.5 million was awarded to expand multidisciplinary teams, which are comprised of professionals from diverse disciplines, including representation from DA's offices, the NYPD, APS, medical centers, financial institutions, and a myriad of community-based organizations who jointly provide comprehensive assessments and cons consultations on abuse cases. This expansion from the program's current two, bor two borough portfolio of Manhattan and Brooklyn to all five boroughs is vastly strengthening the city's ability to address complex elder abuse matters in a coordinated fashion. This is essential to resolving interrelated social, financial, criminal, and legal challenges found in the majority of our cases. 225,000 was allocated for PROTECT, which stands for Providing Options to Elderly Clients Together. This program, developed by Difter and Weill Cornell Medical Center, mitigates the impact of depression and anxiety among elder abuse victims. Trained professionals help victims address their mental health issues and to cope, help them cope with abusive situations. In coordination with the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, DIFTA will work with our providers to identify and serve these victims of elder abuse. In recognition of the contributions and challenges of unpaid caregivers, the administration designated $4 million to provide respite and supplemental services. This allocation will augment funding received by DIFTA from the federal Title III-E Family Caregiver Support Program. I would be remiss not to mention the, the, our appreciation for the ongoing support of the City Council. This year, the Council has contributed over $30 million to DIFTA programs. This level of support makes a significant difference in the quality and quantity of services that we and our community-based providers provide. It is through this administration's commitment, coupled by the Council's support, that DIFTA has been able to meet the demands and the needs of an ever-growing population of older New Yorkers. Over the past year, DIFTA has made investments to become even more efficient in our contracting and procurement. These improvements include streamlining our business processes and creating additional staff lines to manage the volume of procurement and budget actions that we encounter each year. As a result of building our increased capacity, DIFTA has made significant improvements. At this time of year last year, DIFTA had only 11% of discretionary contracts registered. Today, 64% of discretionary awards with submitted budgets have had their contracts registered. This represents an approximate 500% improvement from fiscal year 17. And we continue to improve and hope to achieve an even higher rate next year. I'm excited to announce that in line with the administration's broader vision of promoting fairness and equity, the $10 million in baseline funds made available in fiscal year 18, a significant investment in the DIFTA Senior Center Network, will increase to $20 million by fiscal year 21. These funds were designated to help create parity in our senior center budgets and allow for enhanced staffing and programming. DIFTA is distributing the funds in accordance with a model budget developed with input from OMB, from our network of providers and other stakeholders. The key goal of the model budget has been to achieve a more equitable distribution of available funds among centers by creating a floor whereby centers will receive funding to address fixed costs associated with staffing and programming that exists regardless of a center's size. The model budget reflects that a requisite amount of funds are needed to provide threshold levels of quality programming and to pay competitive wages to attract and retain high quality staff. 
As mentioned earlier, the administration increased funding for home sharing by 1.4 million. Plans are already underway to expand the successful home sharing program, thereby increasing the number of affordable housing options in the city, particularly those serving older adults. The program matches individuals needing an available place to live or guests with homeowners or leaseholders who have extra space in their home. They're known as hosts. One of the two parties involved, either the guest or the host, must be a senior in order to participate. There is also an extensive screening and vetting process done by social workers, which is essential to the success of these matches. In addition to negotiating the terms of the living arrangements, social workers conduct follow-up and provide ongoing support. With the increased funding, DIFTA hopes to ramp up the program with the goal of 4,000 placements over the next five years. For the remainder of the testimony, I'd like to take the opportunity to briefly update the committee on a number of DIFTA's ongoing initiatives. Local Law 97 of 2016 required DIFTA to conduct a survey of unpaid caregivers. DIFTA worked closely with city and state agencies, with AARP and other nonprofits assisting caregivers. The survey findings and recommendations were provided to the City Council as required under the law. These recommendations reflected the top identified needs, which include leveraging and expanding awareness about existing resources for caregivers, encouraging New Yorkers to identify as caregivers, educating caregivers about best practices and techniques for providing care, helping caregivers access affordable transportation, supporting legislation that benefits unpaid caregivers, continuing a working group focused on caregiving, and communicating affordable housing efforts and opportunities for caregivers. Local Law 9 of 2015 required all social adult daycare programs operated within New York City to register with DIFTA. As of March 13, 2018, there are 348 active registered programs. Of these, 143 are in Brooklyn, 131 are in Queens, 33 are in Manhattan, 26 are in the Bronx, and 15 are in Staten Island. In addition, I am pleased to share with the committee that in partnership with NYSOFA, OMIG, which is the Office of Medicaid Inspector General, DOHMH, and the New York State Adult Day Services Association, DIFTA is launching a series of trainings for competence and quality assurance units of the managed long-term care companies operating in New York City. And it's these MLTCs, as we call them, that really uh, contract with the Social Adult Day Program network in New York City. So it's important that they're educated and they're trained about what those expectations are. And the first training will take place this afternoon, and we will discuss our role, DIFTA's role, as the designated Social Adult Day Care Ombuds Office, followed by presentations from the other participating agencies. So this is a full court press on how to educate the MLTCs and to hold the Social Adult Day Care programs accountable in New York City. Age-friendly New York City, as you know, brings together the public and private sectors to develop initiatives to ensure New York City is a city for all ages. With our partners at the New York Academy of Medicine, DIFTA has coordinated the work of age-friendly New York City over the past 10 years. In 2017, the initiative was updated to include nearly 90 programs spanning health and social services, housing, public spaces and transportation, public safety, and civic and community participation. We have brought copies of the updated Age-Friendly New York City report with us this morning to share with you. As you know, Mayor Bill de Blasio and First Lady McRae released Thrive New York City, a mental health roadmap for all. Among its suit of groundbreaking initiatives were two programs that focused on geriatric mental health. One endeavored to embed mental health practitioners in 25 senior centers across the city, and the other combat social isolation among older adults. This spring, geri geriatric mental health services are available in all of the 25 centers as promised, four in the Bronx, six in Manhattan, six in Queens, eight in Brooklyn, and one in Staten Island. 
Each month, more than 1,500 seniors avail themselves of these services. The Friendly Visiting Program, which was designed to combat social isolation, matches volunteers with homebound seniors for weekly visits. Since the program's inception, volunteers have made 17,174 visits to seniors in their homes and have spent a total of 27,200 hours with seniors. Thank you for this opportunity to testify about DIFTA's preliminary budget. I look forward to continuing the partnership with the City Council in serving older New Yorkers, and I am pleased to answer any questions you have. And I welcome the other committee members that have joined us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I wanted to welcome uh, Councilmember Valone from Queens, Councilmember Rose from Staten Island, uh, Councilmember Drum from Queens, and Councilmember Deutsch from Brooklyn. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions, and then I'm going to um, defer to my colleagues to ask some questions, too. So, Commissioner, uh, as I said early in my opening remarks that, um, you know, DIFTA's budget is still less than 1%. Um, you drill it down. Actually, it's less than half of 1%. So, um, you know, we commend the uh, $23 million that the council successfully negotiated with the administration to baseline last year. But what is DIFTA's long-term strategy in addressing the needs of seniors in the city, especially which programs would the agency prioritize to expand or to create? Um, do you believe seniors' needs are met by DIFTA's current service portfolio? And what type of expansion uh, does DIFTA need to keep pace with the growing population of seniors in New York? This is more for you to really projecting ahead and see what we can continue to work on in the next couple of years. Sure. Um, the administration has uh, invested $78 million since this administration alone. So that's a significant increase. And unlike the Department of Sanitation and other city services, these are non-mandated services. But then again, that doesn't mean that they're not essential services to help seniors remain in the community. So those long-term care services and supports have really grown over the last four years, and they're commensurate with the changing demographics. So naturally, as the demographic shifts, our long-term plans and goals are to strengthen, to deliver much more efficiently and in a better way, and always expand the services that are available. And whatever it is that we do, because we do have a wide array of long-term care services and supports in the DIFTA portfolio and through our network of, of community-based organizations that provide these services, will continue to grow and expand, and more importantly, to modernize to meet the needs of a growing population. We need to build capacity to serve a growing population, but within the $78 million that we have now, we're able to provide a tremendous array of services, and we've expanded it every year in this administration, and we continue to do that good work. But can you give me some specifics? So uh, some specifics, I mean, for, for example, for example like, um, council's been supporting sure. um, some of the new mm -hmm. program, because uh, when we met and you were talking right. about the needs for more senior center that serves immigrant population. Right. Um, and they are really, um, it's all over the city. It's all over the city. And as you know, um, not only this, does the model senior center infusion of $20 million by fiscal year 21 go a long way in strengthening the current portfolio that we have and, the, and our, our ability to serve seniors much more effectively, and I think that's the, the key word here. Every senior center now has a fighting chance and an opportunity to provide excellent services. And we couldn't say that uh, a few years ago necessarily because there was such disparity in the levels of funding. So that is going to go a, a, a long way. And also in fiscal year 2021, as you mentioned in your testimony, um, that we will be RFPing for senior centers. So part of the planning process is to look at where our senior center portfolio currently exists, because it really hasn't been looked at in a good 20 years, to see that where the changing demographics are, where those immigrant groups are now that are overflowing at our senior centers, where we need to build capacity. And for example, in some areas where the, there's been a, a change and there's been some gentrification, 
and now the demographic is essentially a younger population, but still there's remnants of older planning efforts where there's five and six senior centers within a, a five block radius. So we're going to have to really examine that, reshuffle the deck. We have an extensive senior center portfolio. As you know, we have 249 senior centers throughout the city. And we will look at the changing demographics. And when we issue the RFP, it very, very well uh, may be that we will uh, change those community districts and those catchment areas for those senior centers. But that's an extensive planning process. We're looking to the future, and that's an ongoing effort that we've already started um, through our planning department. Well, just uh, one point uh, when you were talking about, in your testimony, uh, you do mention that there are over 300 um, social adult daycare that's registered with the Department for the Aging. Yes. There's more social adult daycare program than senior centers. And in some ways, that shows there is such a great need out there. Um, well, and so we need to really right. build that senior center portfolio. So this senior social adult daycare network, the 368 social adult daycares that have been registered through the local law, uh, that was established, and we do now have a registry, so we know where they all are. Most of them are concentrated in, in Brooklyn and in Queens. Um, they're now registered, so we know who they are. When there's a complaint, we can go out and we can do whatever investigation that we have the authority to do. Um, it, it sort of representing the need in one area and then the market demand in the other, because as you know, these are not DIFTA funded or DIFTA supervised centers, these are, are centers that are out on the private market, many of which are somehow associated with health facilities in their, in their neighborhoods or manage long-term care companies and whatever, they have their own network. So as long as there's a demand for these services, the social adult daycares will proliferate. Now, I'm under the assumption that there is a tremendous need for social adult daycare do we need 368? I don't know. But I know that we do need quality programs. And the constituents of a social adult daycare program may or may not be the same population as our senior centers. So there is a little bit of overlap, and we realize that there is some competition. But in all reality, what it should be is that people who qualify for a social adult day program with significant cognitive and physical impairments should go to a social adult daycare of a quality program and really that's addressed and, and equipped to meet the needs of um, the constituents that they're serving. So we're making a concerted effort at the Department for the Aging to educate the market providers of social adult daycare and the market, meaning MLTC's um, payors of social adult daycare services, what exactly constitutes uh, uh, the appropriate clientele, what they should expect, and what they should be purchasing in terms of quality care. So many of these market um, entrepreneurs that come and want to open social adult daycare centers, they call up DIFTA and they come in and, and we meet with them because we feel it's our responsibility at least to speak with them, see what their intentions are, and I can tell you from our experience, many of them have never even worked with a senior. Yep. And to me, that's pretty deplorable, and we do everything we can to discourage them from opening up something of which they have no competence, but we don't, can't necessarily control that, but we do our best. But the whole education piece around working with the MLTCs themselves and working with the social adult daycare programs, if they're amenable to speaking to us, we would educate them. We do educate them. The first of which the, the, the biggest initiative is actually this afternoon where we're bringing together all the state and city agencies and we're educating them about what they should expect when they purchase that service. I'm glad to hear that uh, and I hope that we can work with the state to really strengthen mm -hmm. the monitoring they have to crack down on some of these who are really abusing government funding. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that our seniors are getting the best care and not taken yeah. advantage of. Um, and just a follow-up question on the, um, the model budget. We were very excited last year that 
Uh, the administration, the mayor baselined $10 million uh, to support our senior centers, and when we went around to the senior center, everyone was excited about that, but we need to get that money out the door. So um, how many uh, contracts uh, have DITA already uh, modified, approved in terms of the uh, contract amendment so that centers can get the money right away? Okay, so um, that's a, a very good point. And I have with me our budget director, Sasha Fishman, who's been working around the clock for the last several weeks to actually notify all of our providers um, out of the 249 senior centers, all but 26 centers, will be getting an additional infusion of money. So we're in the process, they've been notified of the funding amount and there's some budgetary work and contractual work that needs to get done. They've been notified, they have a, a deadline, I believe in another two weeks, of which that they have to return um, their proposals back to DIFTA and we'll be sitting down with every single one of them and processing those amendments in a very timely way. So we're already in the process uh, of getting those amendments through. And we're committed to actually um, spending the whole $10 million in baseline funding and I'm gonna stick my neck out here <laughs> because we may have to work a lot of overtime in order to do that because it is late in the fiscal year and we acknowledge that so we have a lot of work to do but we've already started. Yeah, because uh, for the next year, we wanted to baseline more than 10 million. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be pushing for 15 million. Uh, so you gotta like work it out there so that you can get that money out the door quicker too. Uh, so part of the, the baseline program that are in, included in the, the model budget, can you let us know like what baseline program are gonna be included in these, the model budget for, uh, for instance, what type of program uh, well, uh, dip, well, like a, a mid-sized center with about $40,000 okay, in so programming. Okay, so what we've done is, how we've looked at the model senior center budget is we've looked at two very important areas, and one of them is the staffing component, which we call uh, personnel, and then there's the programming aspect of it. So there's additional monies, for example, amidst, we've through the model budget, for example, and this is a little bit of budget speak, um, the $40,000 for programming will be go, go towards hiring consultants, for example, or hiring an activities director that would actually provide the programming and, and much more robust programming that they currently have. And it's important that, that DIFTA look at and approve what type of program because we want more evidence-based programmings that are actually going to provide the health outcomes that we need them to provide. And also staffing. So we know, for example, in a large senior center, you need um, an executive director or a program manager, whatever the sponsoring agency should call it. But somebody who's there full-time overseeing the programs um, and, and as an administrator, you need a social worker you need somebody who's going to maintain the senior center and, and do some housekeeping and, and maintenance. And you need somebody who's over um, operations and over the programming aspect of it. So the model senior center budget takes into account uh, the two main things is programming and staffing. So we've established what that floor looks like. So you know, are we going to say you have to pay your executive director such and such no, we're not going to do that, but if you're underpaying, a senior center is grossly underpaying their program manager, we're going to look at their proposal and say, we think that you should be paying them more in order for you to retain and, and attract qualified staff. So we do, we are setting the floor, which we hope will not become the ceiling because we have much more work to do. What the senior center budget, model budget, does not look at, and I think this is very important because it's not that we omitted it on purpose or we are not thinking that it needs to be addressed because it does and it will in the next phase of the model senior center is the whole food service component. And that's being looked at as a separate exercise. So you'll be hearing more of that. We've um, recontracted with our consultants to look at the food service component, we know that there's much more work to be done on that front as well. So right now the model budget does not take in consideration of 
food costs and the rent? Well, it does take into consideration the rent, so I think that there's a, it's, it's a little um, difficult to explain um, without getting into the nitty-gritty of the formula that we use to come up with the model senior center, but there is a mechanism currently in place to deal with rent escalations, so that remains the same. But when we looked at the model senior center, as I said, we focus primarily on programming and staffing, and the bottom line includes rent as it always did. How we, we just didn't set an, so an average rent because you can't do that. That's variable in all centers. And as you know, some centers don't pay any rent because they're in church basements, for example, and they just pay utilities. And some pay exorbitant rents. So we had to take that out for the exercise of coming up with what the adequate staffing and programming should be for a senior center that does not mean that, net, that the, the current rent for a particular center wasn't added back in at the end. And if there is any escalations around rent, OMB and DIFTA currently has a system in place and that will be ongoing. Okay. Um, we've also been joined by Council Member Eugene. Uh, I am going to uh, have other Council Member ask some questions and I can come back. Council Member Malone, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair, or Mighty Margaret, that we call her as she <laughs> fights for our seniors. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning, everyone out there, our advocates and our seniors. You know you're in the right committee when Councilmember Rose and I are looking for a light to read the reports. So <laughs> first I went from glasses, now I'm looking for extra lights, so it's, it's qu quickly approaching. We, we do, we do. So you know what, I, I have, there's so many, there's so many topics, and there's so much that DIFTA is responsible for the council members and, and the chair. We were kind of trying to break down the different topics, but since you were just talking about the senior center budgets, why don't we just continue with that? So, okay. you had said there was uh, you broke down the senior center budget to one staffing, two programming, and there was forty thousand allocated. No, that, I didn't say that. Um, I guess that forty thousand figure came from one of our demonstrations of how we arrived at what the proper staffing level is for a particular category of senior center. And so it's, it was just based on last year? It was illustrative for illustrative purposes only. That's, that's not what we were saying. But what we are saying is, is we did an extensive analysis, DIFTA staff, along with OMB, it was a, a year-long process, where we actually looked at what is the adequate staffing level that we can achieve the right outcomes. So we wanted to know what is the what is the baseline funding of which we can say a senior center has enough money to provide X number of X amount of programming so that we can get the proper health outcomes. So I think that was just for illustrative purposes. It may be different for a very small center. And all of these model senior center budget numbers what came came about by um, the average daily participants of a center. So not necessarily the number of people who come and actually eat lunch, because that's not necessarily how many people attend a center each day and participate in activities, but the average daily attendance. So we had to have some way to stratify the level of funding based on some centers have 450 people, some have 60. So when was the last time a report like that was done? A report like what? What you just stated about reviewing the socials about the senior centers and looking at the programming and the costs. And you said it was a very, very long time since the last right. time. Right. So we just we once. finished up that process about two weeks ago. So and prior to that, when was the last time that? Oh, was I, it was it was not in my lifetime that <laughs> I know of. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, that's part of our part of our. We're happy that it was done last. It, it was done. I, I really cannot say I do not know. Well, that's I, what I don't I'd know. like to see. The difference. I mean, I, I think it's a moot point because we're doing it now and we're moving forward. We Do know. We have those results. We know, I know, and we know this anecdotally. We know this for a fact that there was a tremendous disparity in the level of funding. But yet, our expectations for a center, whether they were funded for two hundred thousand or whether they were funded for a uh, million dollars, we had the same expectations in terms of outcomes. So, to me. And to everyone, um, that is a, a very unfair expectation. So we're just trying to right that wrong and move forward. 
So this is about equity and fairness. If we tell you we need you to run a senior center and we don't fund you to do that, then, and we hold you accountable, well, that's pretty unfair. Um, and everybody sort of recognizes that. So. All right, so what's the next step in the process? Do we have the results? Yes, we yet? do. And we have $10 million in baseline funding, which we'll be distributing. That funding was made available um, pre-conclusion uh, in fiscal year 18. So we will be distributing that $10 million now. We have the level of funding for every single center that's eligible for this funding. So How out of 249 different? centers, all but 26 centers will be getting additional monies for programming and staffing, and it will be phased in until 2021. So we're in the process, we've distributed those allocations amounts to every single eligible center at this point in time, and we're working with them to register those contracts and to process those budgets. So, so that's, that's 10 million that was allocated to do that. Right. Is that sufficient? And 10 million allocated over uh, this current fiscal year, next fiscal year, and then through 2021, we'll be phasing in all 20 million. So we're in the process of doing that right now. And have we altered the formula for the different reimbursements? Because obviously some of the senior centers are getting so, much more than, and how do we come to the conclusion so, as to what's So we differentiated that based on five categories. And as I said, it's based on average daily attendance. So how many sen senior centers, and we have historical data to back that up. Um, we looked at actuals, how many people actually attended the center over the past couple of years. So we looked at that and we took out whatever anomalies and made an accounting for that as well because some centers, for example, shut down for extensive renovations. So we didn't want to penalize any particular center for some, some anomaly and, and we based it on that. So it's stratified, but th there's not a significant difference between um, what it costs to run a center, for example, for 100 people than it does for 400 other than raw food and disposables because there are certain fixed costs that, th that the center needs to expend regardless of the number of people that are actually going to the program. But Is we there did a way for the centers to, to uh, based on that new determination, if they feel there's inadequate, is there a way for them to appeal or deploy for additional funding? I think that, and, and, and I would probably go to bat with this because I was extensively involved, as was the um, OMB staff and very high-level staff. We, we can, I feel very great confidence in the formulas that we used and that it was a fair and equitable process. So, you know, appealing, um, we will certainly go back and check our formulas and make sure we didn't make a mistake, but I have... 100% confidence that we did everything that we can to distribute these funds in the most fair and equitable way. And yep. I was personally involved with that process, so. The, the overhead costs of running the center, that's not included in this? It is included. It is included, so I, is uh, But not necessarily rent and utilities, but it is included in the fact that, that it was added back. So it's a sort of a, um, a way, a way to account for those OTPS expenses, but the, the occupancy expenses were taken out for the purpose of examining what it costs to run a center in terms of adequate programming and adequate staffing. So there is a, currently a process in place that looks at escalations in leases, for example, and occupancy costs so that has not changed. We've continued to do that. So the DIFTA seems to be continuing being handled more and more things to do from other agencies. So we're always advocating to make sure you're at full staff. Are, are you comfortable that your staffing levels is at 100% or do you still have some vacancies? So we have a very low vacancy rate at the Department for the Aging. Um, so we're, we're comfortable with that. We were able to get uh, several staffing lines in our procurement division last year, which we've hired up, and we've seen a significant improvement in our procurement processes and the time it, it, it takes for us to process contracts. So um, we thank you for your advocacy. We've, we've uh, staffed up in that regard, and we're, we're doing a, a much better job as a result. Are we asking for any new staff to be put into DIFTA? Not at this time. 
I think we should. We're always there to, to help. I think uh, just the reality of what is on your plate. I think just as the council is ramping up to increase our staff, I think DIFTA should be doing the same, and we'd be happy to go to bat for you on that. Um, I think as one of the, and I'll end with this and turn over back to my council members, with case management, it's always a annual battle as to what a particular case manager can hold, handle, and how many cases are they handling per staffer. So do we have the ratio now of where our case management list is, what the wait list is, and how many are being handled per staff? So we um, have established what we think the correct staffing ratio should be. So we try to maintain a caseload of 65 cases per case manager, and the infusion of, of up to now $7.3 million to add additional case managers has significantly reduced um, the, the, um, the caseload and significantly reduced the wait list for services, but as you know, as you reduce wait lists, more people come on to the, to the roster. So as the demographic change, it's always a, a dynamic process. So we've um, added money in the, in the past several years to uh, attract staff, so those, those salaries were increased, and we've been done a, a tremendous job, as I mentioned in the testimony, of retaining staff. So we're seeing the fruits of that labor right now. Um, currently, we have 1,000 people on the wait list, actually 1,100, but since we're still staffing up, um, and I, once we, we're fully staffed, 100% staffed, uh, we can reduce that wait list by another 100 or so. So I would say that there's a real uh, wait list of 1,000 um, people on, for, on the wait list for case management. Um, we have a very small home care wait list of 200 people at this current time, and I think that that may level off, and it's not so much um, a, a matter of not having the hours to distribute. It's more of uh, an indication of, our, of the home care agency's inability to hire long-term care staff to actually do the work, and I think that's a challenge. It's something that... Um, that's not just New York City's problem, it's a, it's a nationwide problem, and we're now working with the State Office for the Aging um, and our other constituents in the home care arena to, to address those issues. But that is going to um, involve some huge policy changes in terms of the home care industry and the long-term care workforce um, that needs to be addressed. And the workforce having to deal with a borough in a city as large as ours, I know in the outer boroughs we've had many complaints yes. of staff having difficulty reaching yes. the outer boroughs to get there, so that's a challenge. So of the 1,100 on the wait list, what does that do with our ratio? Well, Is actually, that, we, we've, been, 65 to one? we've been maintaining the 65 to 1 uh, for the most part. And that really, that's how a wait list is created, right? So if we can bring it, if we bring it up to 70 or 75, we won't have any wait list. But we prefer not to do that. That doesn't mean people on the wait list are not being served. They're being served in, in other ways, but they have not had a home assessment. That's what that means when we have somebody on the wait list. So if they need a home delivered meal, they request it. We, we give that provisionally. Um, and if we can help them access other services vis-a-vis -vis the phone, uh, we do that as well. And the amount of time each person receives with their case manager, has that stayed the same? So if someone needs an hour or two hours or three hours to go through the file, is... So that's, a, so that's variable, and it's all, it's all about managing um, your case mix and your, the acuity of the client and the, the level of care that they need. So that's um, really the responsibility of the case management supervisory staff, and we've done, uh, I think, a much better job of working with our case management programs to tell them what our expectation is and tell them what we expect of them and how better they can manage their caseloads and how they can manage their case, licks, a case mix. And we've also given them um, some tools that they can automate some of their monitoring processes. So we work very closely with our case management programs. Some of them know this, that they're excellent. Some of them are newer at geriatric case management, and they don't necessarily have those processes in place. As you know, um, from the disinvestment in case management, 
prior to this administration over many, many years, that level of excellence really declined. And we're trying to get back to a place where we provide excellent care in our case management programs that a staff are well paid, they're well trained, and they're well supported. And it's all about, to me, supervision, supervision, supervision. And it sounds like you said you're going to be revamping up and getting some additional, which is good, because yes. Councilmember Chin and some of the council members up and I have interagency bills pending to make sure that DIFTER is aware. So many of the senior issues that come up through subsequent committees that aren't before you are dealing with a senior. And we always yes. ask, has DIFTER been notified? Is there a case open? And more often than not, it's a no. So. We so, have bills so pending to make sure that you get notice of all of these files that are being opened. Okay. And with that, I'd yes. like to hand So that, that is a, a big part of our age-friendly initiative, as I mentioned. So part of that age-friendly um, initiative in the past year or two has been around coordinating all of the city agency around their, their aging initiatives. So that's meeting, um, and, and Deputy Commissioner Karen Resnick coordinated this on behalf of DIFTA, along with Janine Ventura, um, meeting with every single city agency and, and looking at how they're working with seniors and really um, bringing all of those efforts together and coordinated so that everybody knows what everyone else is doing. And out of that, there were 90 initiatives that focused on seniors. And we've, we've um, actually have that manual, and, and we've published uh, what those initiatives are, and we'll be happy to share them with you and the council. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, council Member Rose. Question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, when I, I was doing a, a little research, and I do mean just a little, um, I found an interesting uh, fact that Staten Island having, it's no surprise that it's Staten Island, right? But <laughs> Staten Island has the fastest growth of senior population in New York City from the years 2000 um, to 2010, with 85-year-olds plus uh, being the fastest growing group in the city. And so um, that causes me uh, great concern because I believe that that then um, exponentially increases the, the need for caregiver services. And so um, caregiver services, as we know, because of their age, they will more than likely need in place, you know, uh, caregivers um, working for them to help run errands and helping with legal and financial matters. And um, in November 2017, DIFTA testified that um, they would amend um, 10 contracts that you had, caregiver contracts that you have, by January 2018. Um, have you been able to do that? Have you been able to do that? Yes. Um, thank you, Council Member Rose, for bringing up Staten Island, and it's definitely <laughs> um, a growing, it seems to a be growing a recurring demographic theme but, with me. <laughs> but in the administration, we, we have not forgotten Staten Island. And uh, I'm happy to say, when I looked at um, the distribution of the senior center model budget funding, Staten Island, I believe, is getting the highest proportion because they were the lowest, um, had the lowest level of funding per center, so that, that, you know, that will go a long way in supporting the senior center network on Staten Island. Now, the infusion of $4 million the administration has for caregiver services, which is, will be spent um, predominantly on support services and respite services, mm -hmm. will be distributed, and those contracts are in the process of being amended as we speak. So that $4 million will go a long way on Staten Island and the caregiver program on Staten Island will get a significant increase. Well, my in concern for isn't that. only Staten Island, um, Commissioner. Um, so, and so could you tell me, like, sure. uh, if you have some sort of breakdown um, and why it costs, it would cost $4 million to serve um, 
a projected number of 300 people. So it's not, it's an additional $4 million. So, addition. so these programs are already um, established caregiver programs. This is an additional $4 million to purchase additional respite care and support services. So they, the existing contracts for caregiver services will be amended to the tune of $4 million. So that's on top of the, the funding that they're already getting. Um, and that's something that obviously uh, th there are many things that came out of the, the survey for unpaid caregivers, the biggest of which, the biggest need was for respite services. So in recognition of that, um, $4 million was added to the budget this year so that we can expand respite services and also the need for um, education around these services are actually available for caregivers if they self-identify as caregivers. So we're in the process of uh, working with a, an advertising company to do a huge public outreach campaign. Um, so that's a, that's um, that was that. one of my questions. Mm -hmm. How are we doing outreach to seniors? I mean, you know, conventional wisdom now is that we reach out on social media and online and everything. Right. And we still have a large segment of this population that is still a part of the digital divide. They are not computer savvy. How are we reaching them to tell them about these services that you know, we've, um, we've brought online. So we're, we're going to be doing um, a, an extensive outreach campaign. So part of that is not only social media, but through more traditional media, meaning radio and television. One, one thing that we, we have come to learn is that everybody has a television. Um, certainly, even caregivers, they may not even have the time or energy to go online and, and surf the internet. Um, necessarily, especially if you're a caregiver and you're also working and have other things going on in your life. But most people do have a radio on and they do have a television. So we're going to be concentrating on that. And with the purpose of actually helping a person identify that they are even a caregiver. Yes, they may be a daughter, they may be a son, they may be a daughter-in-law, um, but they're also a caregiver in that sense. Mm -hmm. So self-identifying as a caregiver um, realizing that you need help is a very big, important piece of it. And once you realize that and, that, and then you know that there's assistance out there, you'll avail yourself of those services. Do we still engage in old-fashioned snail mail? Um, we engage in it less and less. Uh -huh. Number one, it's very expensive. And number two, um, we do it. I mean, we do that, but we're having this debate at DIFTA because the snail mail thing I don't necessarily think is very effective. Um, a lot of the snail mail goes into the snail garbage bins. <laughs> so okay. we're seeing less and less of that. Um, mm -hmm. And a as you know, I mean, I, I get my snail mail every day and a lot of junk mail, and most of it I don't even open up. So. Um, we're trying to bombard people mm -hmm. in every which way. And we find that with caregivers, um, especially new caregivers that come up with, you know, there's an acute situation, they find themselves needing help. That's when they, you know, the light bulb goes off in one's head and says, oh, I need help. Let me find out what's available out there. And it's at the point of which they're actually in that situation. So a lot of knowing this proactively and before you actually need it, people don't necessarily pay attention as much as when they actually need the service. I, I just want to say, um, yes, for the most part, most people don't pay attention to their mm -hmm. um, the mail that they get delivered to their home. But um, if I'm someone, uh, I might not have time to watch TV. I might miss it on uh, the commercial or the advertisement. Um, and that if something is mailed to my home and um, I might put it aside for when I, I need it, I just think we shouldn't eliminate no. it, you know. I agree. In its, in I its agree. Totality. It's, it's, it's in our toolbox, but it's not the primary right. method. And um, could you tell me how many people are actually served by um, this, uh, this number um, with the addition of the four million? How many people we're serving? So we, that we plan to serve. 
I'll get you that number of what we've projected. Okay. That we would serve. Well, you're all, you're already serving a certain so number. So we're already of people. serving. What? You're talking about adding 300 people um, now. So um, that currently number. So we're currently serving 1,000 people. So um, I'm sorry, 11,000 people. 11. Hmm? Currently. And and that's so is that just for that's respite without, care? That's without or? the four million. So in our 10 programs, we're mm -hmm. currently serving 11,000 people, and I will get okay. you the number that we've projected for the four million. So we did. Okay. So um, well, you are serving um, only 92 people with the uh, for respite care uh, currently. And um, so we we'll, so currently so that four million dollars will significantly um, up that number as well. So I, we did we did why a projection. is it costing three um, four million dollars to serve three hundred people? Um, yeah, three hundred people. Is that our projection was three hundred? So I don't I don't know. Right. All right. So what's the 300 number? Okay. So can we um, discuss this offline because I'm not sure where your numbers are coming from. But respite is a very expensive service, as you know. Give, give me a minute. Okay. Commissioner, it was in the these, these are November, actually the it? numbers that were testified in, um, to in November. So we're just giving them back to you. Okay. So you need time to get back to so us. They may, with that? Those numbers may have been revised. That's why I'm a little bit confused. Okay. Um, okay. So you will get back to. So actually, that I'm being told the number went from 300 to 450. For for, rest for the four million dollars now. No. It will, no, 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 that's prior. Four hundred and fifty people avail themselves of respite services for the traditional ten programs of, of uh, through the caregiver program. So this is an additional four million, and then we projected how much, uh, how many people would be served, and that's just a projection for the four million. That's the number that I need to get to you. It's okay. All right, please, please okay. do. Um, and um, we're seeing an uptick in um, in homeless seniors. Um, is there any um, plan to um, have uh, senior um, homeless shelters for seniors, senior-based homeless shelters? So I'm going to um, defer to F Fran Winter, a deputy commissioner for operations, who was the former former Deputy Commissioner at Department of Homeless Services. So she's been uh, in close contact with the Department of Homeless Services working around remedies for seniors that are homeless. We, we do have um, on occasion, uh, and it, it, it may be growing, um, senior centers that serve homeless seniors, and they're welcome to come in as any senior is. I think the question is, um, is the staff prepared to, to work with them to meet any special needs they have? Can we integrate them into the life of the senior center? So what we do is we reach out to DHS, the Department mm -hmm. of Homeless Services, their outreach teams, because frequently for these homeless seniors, they may be coming in from the street, they may be coming in from shelter, but we recognize they may have some special needs. And we um, create a partnership, really, with the senior center staff as well as the DHS staff or their providers. So they can come in, help train the staff on how to work with homeless seniors, what the services are for homeless seniors. It really is individual to each center how to, how to address the situation with the goal really, I think, of integrating those seniors into the life of the senior center and, and reaching them and getting them services and hopefully um, helping them find a way back into the community. I, and I, I think that's, that's wonderful. But I'm talking about since there are, um, the number is growing, 
Uh, will there be, are you talking about, are you projecting no. the need to have um, shelters specifically for homeless seniors? Pretty much as we have certain, there are certain populations that we provide shelters for, sheltered living for. Are you looking in that direction in terms of the senior population? That's, re I mean, I think that's part of the analysis that the Department of Homeless Services has to do to see how to serve all of their homeless people, including the numbers of seniors. Traditionally, the number of homeless seniors is, is a fairly small amount in terms of overall homeless, um, and whether they're targeting them for a special population shelter, I'm just not sure at this point. I know they have a, a very large plan to address all of the homeless, and they have been uh, opening shelters to do so. Whether they've created special population senior uh, shelters, I'm just not sure. We'd have to check. So this should be a conversation that you should have with DHS. And um, since seniors are your portfolio, that this is something, and, and unfortunately, we're seeing this trend. We're seeing seniors who are losing their homes, who are no longer to stay in their homes, and you know, as, as this continues to happen, I, I think it's something, it's a conversation that you should be involved in with DHS. Yes, we agree. Madam Chair, I've taken a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Council Member Rose. Uh, we also been joined by Council Member Traeger from Brooklyn. Um, next up on the question, Council Member Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. And good, mo good morning, everyone in the panel. Um, so first, uh, first out, uh, my first question is, what is the procedure for a senior uh, to apply for DIPTA's home sharing program? So there is someone in the audience from New York Foundation for Senior Citizens, which is um, the agency that currently holds the contract for the home sharing program that we will be expanding. They've been doing this for 30 years. So a senior, um, either somebody that has a space to spare in their home or in their apartment um, calls up and, and, and uh, they go through an extensive vetting process and they try to match them with, who, with someone who's requested that they um, enter into a home sharing situation and that person they call is, is a guest. So there's the leaseholder um, or the homeowner and the, the, who is known as the host, and then there's a guest. So they, they go through this extensive vetting process that's done by um, the sponsoring organization, um, and a social wor worker actually does matches, and they have a whole formula, an algorithm that they use, and they actually meet with both parties, and they broker um, a situation, and they, they do the actual matching. So it's an extensive uh, process. It's not something that, that they just call up and you know the next day they get a referral. They're integrally involved in that process and that is, we feel, one of the reasons why they've been so successful at it. So you know, knowing that they have a 30 year history of making successful matches, um, we've decided that we would like to bring this program to scale. So how, do, how does a senior uh, get the phone number, or is it like how does it work? I mean, I, I don't know you, about it. They can avail it if you call three one one. That's the easiest way. Call either Department for the Aging or call three one one and ask for home sharing, and they'll do direct you to the. So the is it agency. an application? Once you make a phone call, is it an application? There's a whole vetting process that that's really been established by the home sharing program. So. Um, does the application process uh, determine if, if a senior is a veteran? So they, they do give preference to veterans and they work with veterans. So it's a, as I said, you know, there's a, an extensive vetting process, an application process. They wanna make sure that those, that they match the right host with the right guest. So that's based on many, many variables, and so there's an extensive process. But in order to get that, that process started, they call 311, and they'll be referred to New York Foundation for Senior Citizens. So um, does, um, do they also conduct an entitlement intake, 
like when a senior calls up to uh, check if uh, a senior is entitlement, uh, entitled to, let's say, SNAP. So New York Foundation for Senior Citizens is also a case management agency, and they're a, a, a geriatric provider of um, very good reputation. So I'm going to you know, take a leap here and, and say that they absolutely do, knowing that that is part of why they exist. So I'm going to say that, yes, they would also look at what other services that the person can avail themselves. Because we do have, uh, I believe, 1.5 million sen seniors. So from the 1.5 million seniors, do you believe that there are um, uh, those who, are in, who may be entitled to SNAP, who is not receiving these services? So uh, in, 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 on a separate note, there are um, a number of seniors who we believe are eligible for SNAP and may not be receiving them, and those are separate initiatives that we've done um, citywide to, to help people enroll in SNAP, and we've been involved in that for a number of years. So the number of people actually enrolled um, through all of these efforts um, has increased over the years. But yes, I'm sure there are a number of people who are eligible and not currently receiving that, and we've done extensive outreach and worked with the third party um, providers to actually um, do some targeted outreach as well as work with HRA and, and our community-based providers to increase the number of SNAP enrollees over the years as a, as yeah. a separate initiative that has really nothing so much my, to do my, with home share. Uh, Commissioner, my concern is that um, there should be like a one-stop shopping that when a senior calls up to, let's say, for a uh, home sharing, right? So we need to work from the bottom up you know, first to see if the senior um, is, is eligible for any city resources, uh, to check if the senior is a veteran, because there are federal resources and more than half our city's veterans, mm -hmm. 210,000 veterans are senior citizens who have um, federal resources that are available to them. And then once we figure out and get them the resources that they need, since we do have many seniors who are eligible for SNAP and, and is not receiving, uh, those benefits. So th those same seniors could come in for, let's say, a home sharing, and then it's overlooked to see what other resources are missing for that individual. And then we're spending money, uh, we're putting in funding, um, and when that person may be entitled to, to SNAP. So, and I commend the mayor because we have now the uh, uh, Department of Veteran Services. It's a one-stop shopping. Um, there's uh, there's a new program, uh, Vet Connect, which is like a one-stop shopping for veterans. So we need to come up uh, with a program so for senior citizens. So we have so this a way program. we could see exactly right. how we could help right. them all around. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Right now it seems like piecemeal, you know. It's, it's not piecemeal. What we call it, it it's one-stop shop, but there's many doors you can come and enter, and you should always get, and every senior should always get, um, an assessment about what benefits and entitlements that they may be eligible for. So one of the efforts through our senior centers, for example, is that through the model budget, which we were talking about earlier, every center will have a social worker, for example. If you don't have somebody to actually do the benefit screening, then it can't get done. So now that we'll have the proper funding so that they can have the proper staffing, that should become an essential part of every seniors that comes through the door of a senior center at some point in time, at some point during the year, when they're either assessed or reassessed, that they go through that benefit and entitlement screening. Whether they go to a senior center, whether they go through a case management program, which is part of the assessment process, a full benefit and entitlement screening. Whether they go to a senior fair, that, that, that they, they can avail themselves of those services. Whether they call 311, whether they call um, New York Connects, which is the no wrong door, which is a whole full screening for, for long-term care services and supports. There's many ways that they can as access a benefit and entitlement screenings. And there's you know one stop, there's every stop, as far as I'm concerned. And it becomes part of the practice in any of our DIFTA-funded programs that a person is um, assessed for whatever they might be entitled to. So I agree with you, um, and you know, the more that we can impress upon um, our providers 
and our non-DIFTA community partners that are not in the DIFTA network necessarily, and we do extensive outreach to our outreach department um, at DIFTA to infiltrate into the community and places where seniors are, but they may not necessarily be a DIFTA program to do these types of entitlement and benefit screenings. And, I, and we, it's a full court press all the time um, to do it, and they should be able to access that. If anybody needs an entitlement screening, the best place to, to call is 311, and we'll send them somewhere, whether it's a one-stop, and they do have one-stop centers just for this purpose, or for any senior center, they should be able to be fully screened for anything that they may be available for. And they have computer programmings, several of them, different ones, there's Access New York City, there's benefits that, a, there's a program from NCOA, um, and so many different um, aging membership organizations that have developed proper programming. Live On New York does an entitlement and benefit screening, enroll people in SNAP, and we've been very successful. Could we do better? Yes, of course. Um, but I agree with you that that should be um, just part of everyday practice. Yeah, okay, so just to be more streamlined. Um, I just want to touch upon what my colleague mentioned, uh, uh, Council Member Rose. <coughs> so we do have uh, 63,000 homeless people in our city. So we do keep in a track of you know homeless youth. We have uh, Councilman Traeger from our, our education chair. Uh, you have uh, a little over 100,000 uh, homeless youth. You have a um, uh, little uh, over 450 homeless veterans. Uh, we have a number, I believe, to homeless families. But is there a number for homeless seniors? I know you mentioned that there's not that many, but do we have a number? Yes, DHS actually has that number, um, and they track that, the number of homeless seniors. It's around, uh, it, uh, it generally hovers around 2,000. So they may be, you know, seniors, that may not be their first category, they may be overlapped with veterans, they may be um, seniors that have some other identifier in addition to being a senior. Um, but yes, that's tracked by DHS, not by DIFTA. So uh, can you explain what a homeless senior is? Is it a homeless senior who's in a shelter? Is it a homeless senior who's on the street? So th I'm gonna defer to you. All of the above. Yeah, uh, uh, DHS would have both. Uh, they have what they consider the shelter population, which is the 63,000 number, and I think they would have the information as to the age of those 63,000, and they also have the information on who's, uh, who they're serving, who's living on the streets. And they would probably have ages for those as well. So, uh, so would you, um, from the 2,000 homeless seniors, right? So, what percentage would be uh, seniors who maybe have a mental illness, who just uh, choose to live in the streets, uh, opposed to um, seniors who just can't afford rent and are living on the street? DHS would have that. They do have a client tracking database where they have information about their clients. So, I think. We could, we could work with them to get you the information you're looking for. So, um, so those living in the streets that um, just can't afford rent, like where are they? It I mean, who's keeping track of those seniors? The, the mayor has recently, over the last couple of years, increased the street outreach effort. Are they living like, uh, you know, under the, some train trestle? Are they under a boardwalk? I mean, where are they? You'd, I mean, you'd really have to ask DHS because they have a, a very strong outreach team, set of teams that are um, really done through providers throughout all the five boroughs, and they actually are in touch with those people living on the street, and they generally have locations where those people tend to congregate. They can move, obviously, um, but they usually know where they find their, at least the, the people that are chronically out on the street. They're tracking them, they're working with them to engage them to come in off the streets. They have... Uh, have so I just, I just want to say that if you have um, a homeless person who's living outside in the street who has a mental illness, right? No one would want to take someone in who doesn't have the experience to deal with someone like that. But if you tell me there's a homeless senior who just couldn't afford to pay rent out on the street, tell me now, I will take someone in. So I mean, if you have, let's say, um, 2,000 homeless seniors and we do a big push to, to, uh, to, to the eight point population just went up, 8.6 million New Yorkers. Uh, we are New Yorkers. So if you could tell us that there are 2,000 senior citizens who just couldn't afford rent, they are living out in the street, 
those seniors will be housed any time. Um, I think that as New Yorkers, we would take them in. We would welcome them into our homes. So I think we need to get the, uh, the handle on how many homeless seniors there are out there who just couldn't afford to pay the rent and reach out to New Yorkers and say, listen, who can take, you know, you're talking about a home sharing, right? So this is home sharing. Right. Uh, you tell me, I, I would, so my wife would tell me in one second, let's so take someone So the part in. of the home sharing proposal is to work with DHS and, and, and serve exactly the uh, constituents that you're describing. I mean, I think Homeless this seniors, if they need it, they can become part of the home sharing program and they will be placed. But that, that that's, will be priority. Commissioner, that's not good enough because we're using seniors as a number and we can't do that. So I think that um, we should identify so who I they are, where they are, and take care of them immediately. DHS has other programs. So DHS has an entire um, effort around placing seniors that are difficult to serve and, and, homeless po and the homeless population in general. If a senior wants to be part of the home sharing program, they can avail themselves to home sharing. They could have always availed themselves, and I just happen to know this because in conversation with the executive director, they've been working directly with DHS to place homeless seniors, um, and that has not necessarily been the preferential um, mode for the actual homeless senior. So we're gonna work on, as part of this new um, expansion of the program, to make those matches work and to do better outreach with the homeless. So that's part of their proposal. So yes, th they can avail themselves of the home sharing program and there'll be a much more concerted effort to place homeless seniors in a home sharing situation. So we have what's called now breaking ground and they are trained to go out okay. there and offer assistance to right. homeless people. Yes. So I cannot imagine that you have a senior who's out there in the street who's offered assistance by breaking ground to say, do you want a place to live? So I, I, that one I, of those seniors wouldn't say yes. So, so I mean, why is there 2,000 homeless seniors? So I'm going to defer to um, Commissioner Banks, who's oversees the Department of Homeless Services. So, I mean, I would just ask Social the chair Services. if we could have another hearing here with DHS and uh, breaking ground. No, and I agree. And, 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 and having, having in a former life um, worked very closely with um, that particular agency in homeless prevention programs, um, they are... Uh, they do a, an extensive amount of outreach to homeless people to try to place them. And you know, in situations where they do go into a supportive housing situation, which is not what DIFTA does, but when they do, they generally very successful, but it's a more extensive program and it's, it's more with wraparound services so that helps homeless seniors and mentally ill homeless seniors um, people who have um, other issues other than just being a senior, which is not really an issue, it's just a, um, ju it's just a demographic. Um, they have other issues and they work very successfully with them, um, but that's outside of the DIFTA network, that, that they're all in the, the supportive housing network, the mental health network, or the, or the homeless service network. Thank you, I just wanna say for the record that um, Anytime there's an HPD affordable housing project, and I have been involved just over the last few weeks, um, so when you put aside, let's say, a certain percentage for homeless people in a HPD project, uh, whether it's a, a rezoning, um, any type of EULA process, so first and foremost, we need to make sure that when there's a set aside it should be a set-aside for senior citizens who are homeless and a set-aside for homeless veterans, in addition to your general population of homeless. And I just want to say that for the record because this is kind of embarrassing and for the city of New York and for, it's not your fault, Commissioner, this is uh, something that um, it's, it's kind of, um, aggravating and I can't believe that we're sitting at a hearing here talking about 2,000 uh, homeless seniors out on the street. And I have nothing more to say except that we need to take action right away. And this is really totally unacceptable. Thank you.
thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Um, I already introduced legislation that have um, to get the correct data of number of homeless seniors so that we will definitely be having a hearing with DIFTA and with DHS and then we can really work on this together. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Traeger. Thank you very much, Chair, for uh, your leadership. Um, and welcome, Commissioner, and, and your team. I just want to begin by just acknowledging that uh, yourself and your staff has, has been incredibly responsive and accessible to my office, and I truly do, do appreciate that. Um, having said that, I, I, I'm pretty sure that the Chair might have touched on some of the questions I'm about to ask, but I, I think these issues are very significant. Uh, are there any uh, plans in the, in the budget process so far to expand DIFTA contracts to expand the number of senior centers this year? So we've had, um, uh, we spent a significant amount speaking, speaking about the model senior center budget. So we have a, um, a significant infusion of baseline funding to expand our senior center portfolio. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will be RFPing for all of our senior centers in fiscal year, uh, for fiscal year 2021. So this really uh, infusion of $20 million in baseline money by uh, fiscal year 2021 will allow us to uh, make a significant investment in our senior center portfolio. And when we RFP for it, we will be looking at the changing demographics, and we're currently in that process, to see how we might redistribute those senior centers to, to truly reflect the current demographics and, and the constellation of senior centers in different communities based on the number of seniors that are actually living there at this point in time. But I'm, but I'm not sure if I'm hearing anything for this year, for, for this year, years, this so year's But this year role. we have $10 million in baseline funding to, to support our current portfolio of seniors. But we're not expanding well. to new, is that correct? Not expanding the number of senior centers. And are there per any? Se. And are there any plans this year to expand NORCs? Not this year, no. So, you know, I think w we've had this discussion before, and, and I know this is something that I believe that you personally are very supportive of. Mm -hmm. But I'm just making this clear to the administration that when I hear leaders say that they support seniors, they support immigrants, they support families, they, they understand that we are, we have a, a significant aging population, these are our loved ones, but we're not aligning our budgets to that reality, I have a problem with that. And our budget has grown significantly in the last couple of years, and we have an ambitious housing plan, which we, again, passed ZQA, uh, I know the housing has started to, in some cases, get built or in the process of being built in my district as well. Councilman Deutsch will be pleased to hear that in my district we're actually building senior affordable housing and housing for homeless veterans. Um, but my concern is that once these buildings are up, are they going to have a center that, is, that has reliable, sustainable funding in, uh, you know, attached to it? And I'm sure that the existing providers mm -hmm. are facing whole sorts of challenges with regards to the fact that a lot of their personnel, their staff, uh, don't have the means and capacity to, to, to adequately meet uh, the needs of, of their seniors. And this is something that, you know, we have to make sure that our pledges and our words are aligned to the numbers in our budgets. So and exactly in that vein, in all due respect, um, there will be a significant increase in funding for senior centers in the senior center portfolio. There'll be um, a, an increase in $20 million in funding to support programming and staffing in our senior centers. And I know um, having looked at where everything falls out in your particular centers in your particular district, we'll be getting a significant infusion of dollars to support uh, and baseline dollars to support staffing and to support um, programming and we look forward to working with you because it's going to take some time to build capacity at those centers um, then there's some of the of which are significantly underfunded historically so I think that's a good thing now every senior building that goes up 
Um, can we put in a, a new senior center? Well, we're trying to look at any new projects that are being built, if there's an opportunity to move a senior center that currently exists into new, um, new space that's specifically designed for a senior center, we'll avail ourselves of those opportunities. So as they go up, if you have um, a, a senior housing building or any affordable housing built in your community and you come to us with a proposal, we'll seriously consider that. But we're not necessarily considering opening up new senior centers in every building that's going up in the city because A, the, the surrounding community may not support that in terms of the, the demographics in the community, and that's just uh, practically um, not feasible. But certainly if there is one that's in unacceptable uh, a facility and we have an opportunity to move a center into a new facility, we're, we're all ears and we're very open to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my, you know, I, I know it's, I sound biased because it's my district, but we are experiencing a significant population boom. Uh, we are welcoming of immigrant communities that are continue to emerge and grow, mm -hmm. and we are ripe for additional support because a lot of these organizations are doing this not with the support of DIFTA. They're doing this with discretionary grants, uh, which right now they might be available, but with these, uh, with the uncertainty of, of Washington, which is every day, and, and, and the state budgets, we don't know how much longer we, we can carry this. So I, I think we need, this is a very serious issue. I also want to just point out, um, and uh, ch the chair might have raised this as well, I know that this is not something that's not your, resp that's not your responsibility, uh, the, the Lifeline program. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been uh, discussed yet, yet at this point, but it's very concerning to many seniors in my district and obviously across the city of New York with regards to um, the federal government's uh, plans to eliminate this critical support for seniors who use this program to make appointments with their doctors, uh, with, uh, to get medication. Uh, uh, have you, has your office been monitoring this? Can you speak to that? And also, are there plans? So I don't know specifically about the Lifeline program, but I do know that the current omnibus bill that the Congress passed, and right. it's on the, the president's desk waiting for him to sign, um, maintains or increases the funding available for senior services. So I think that's uh, um, good news. Um, and it's something Except for his tweet this morning that he, he is considering vetoing the bill. Well, so, uh, I'm I not think sure. that's, so, unfor but that's unfortunate. And, and, uh, but in terms of Congress supporting all of these efforts and acknowledging that there is a changing demographic and expanding and increasing the funding available for senior services, I think, says a lot about the commitment of Congress now we have to impose that upon our president to sign that bill so that we can maintain or expand that level of funding. And we're involved in that as a department, working with our membership organizations at the federal level and with the city um, legislative office, um, working to advocate on the federal level. So we're going to Washington. We'll be there this um, in April and meeting with our legislators to, not, to support an expansion of senior programs, and, and I'm not particularly familiar about the the threats to that particular program, but I'll be happy to look into yeah, it. Yes, so this is an FCC program to provide uh, assistance mm -hmm. to uh, seniors with very um, l l limited means uh, to make phone calls, cell phone service, utility services, um, and they use that as a lifeline, literally, to call their doctor, to follow up with appointments, to get medication, uh, this is not a luxury item right. for seniors, oh, I know. Uh, yeah. and, and so, uh, but it speaks to the larger question, and this is my final question, Chair, thank you for, for your time, to uh, addressing the cost of utilities and the cost of these basic needs, which for seniors is, is a necessity. Um, is, is, are there plans, discussions underway to, uh, if the federal government cuts back on Lifeline, or in some cases in dealing with energy and other utility uh, types of cost to provide some forms of assistance to seniors, particularly those who have very difficult time 
paying for prescriptions, paying for, for food. Uh, are there any programs or services that at the city level that we can assist our seniors with? So the, the city makes a significant investment in supporting seniors and the Department for the Aging budget of $344 million does a lot to do that. Now are we making um, significant contingency plans based on the eventuality that our president will not sign an omnibus bill and fund senior services at the current level and, and certainly there's threats um, we're not making contingency plans at the Department for the Aging because we don't know how real those threats are. Um, but I, I mean, I acknowledge that it, it is the, at the federal level, um, we're living in very scary times. Right. No, no but we do, have, we do have a significant investment in senior services and we're very fortunate in New York City that the city government does take their responsibility to support seniors very seriously. So much of our funding at the Department for the Aging is city tax levy uh, monies as well that augment federal funding. So in, in all actuality, I think we'll be okay here in New York City. Just That's not to acknowledge that there are people who depend on Lifeline for utility services. And as I said, we'll look into it. And if we need to do more advocacy around that specific program, we'll do that. Yeah, I'll just close by saying, Chair, as you've seen in the, in the issues of public housing, in the issue of education, transportation, where the federal government has not given us adequate, sufficient resources, this is an area that we, we can't ignore either. Um, uh, we, I, I understand that the federal government has, has just abdicated its responsibility in so many different areas of life. It, it's, it's completely uh, outrageous, and it's, it's just, it's, 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 I think it's a huge stain on, on, on their inability to get things done, but we just can't put our heads in the sand either. We, we have to make sure that we have uh, everything uh, you know, prepared in the eventuality or if something happens that we can't meet basic needs and services. And I know that you are committed, Commissioner, and I thank you again for your leadership. And Chair, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger. Um, just want to follow up with another question. Uh, relating to the model senior center budget. Um, can you maybe go into more detail? Because meal, the cost for meal has been left out of model budget. So at this stage, so how far along has DIFTA done its analysis in terms of um, meal costs and the, the discrepancy now among a lot of centers? Some, you know, I mean, a lot of centers have historically complained to us that not enough reimbursement for meal costs. So how are we gonna address that in the So in the we are um, re-engaging uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers was the consultant that we were working with to look at food service across the board, meal reimbursement, and how we can modernize our food service system in New York City, both um, congregate and home delivered meals. So we're re-engaging that, and we know that we did not address that in the Model Senior Center in terms of the food service component and the reimbursement for meals, and that would be phase two. So we are also in discussions with OMB about how best to, to, to look at the situation, analyze it, and um, those conversations are ongoing. So, and we're committed to doing that. I mean, this is you know a priority at the department. So are you, when you're saying re-engaging, so you're signing a new contract with no, them? No, we, 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 we re-RFP'd, but, but fortunately the consultants that we were working with got the new RFP. Um, they were awarded the proposal. So we're actually meeting with them next week to reignite the process where we left off. Unfortunately, it has to somewhat to do with funding and procurement so that there was an interruption in that process but in the interim, we dealt with the senior center uh, model budget situation and dealt with everything other than food service. So now there's a, you know, we're doubling up on our commitment to address the food service component and we, everybody's on board with that. So that work will be starting again next week and we're gonna come up with um, how we can better serve food in the city, how we can be much more efficient how we can um, capitalize on new technology that exists to address some of the issues even that you've spoken of earlier around collecting contributions from seniors. No senior should go into a senior center and feel as if 
they're coerced into giving a contribution at this day and age. That's not to say, and you know, I feel very strongly about this, that seniors generally want to contribute towards the cost of their meal um, in general, and there may be a significant number of seniors that absolutely cannot afford a meal, and they should be able to um, find a way to put something in the contribution box, even if it's an empty envelope, in a way that's non-coercive and, and maintains the dignity and the confidentiality of the person. So, you know, you've brought that to my attention. We're going to do a better job working with our program offices to reinforce some common sense solutions on how they should be collecting contributions. But in addition to that, there are more modern ways that we can change our, our practices and our policies to eliminate that even, you know, the, to eliminate any coercive tactics and even the possibility that that could actually um, be a reality. And I well, know that sometimes there is, you know, there is in a senior center, they have some bully that's sitting um, collecting contributions and making sure that somebody puts their money inside a shoebox slot, right? There's no reason for that. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, we should have little envelopes. People put it in, and if they, they can't afford it, they don't put anything in. But we're required through the Older Americans Act, it's codified in the Older Americans Act, to collect contributions that goes towards the cost of the meal, and they're also able to collect contributions to go towards the cost of an activity. Anything collected gets reinvested back into the program or to the meal if it's collected for a meal. And that is an essential, and we count on that, and programs count on that contribution. So we should find better ways to collect the contribution and making sure that we maintain the dignity and the confidentiality. So if that's an issue, we're gonna you know, double down on, on how we assess that, and if we need to change our practices, we will. Well, definitely at the meal costs. I mean, like, if providers are telling us that they need that contribution to supplement the meal, that means that we're not paying enough, um, putting enough money in the budget for the meal program, because there are discrepancy in terms of some centers pay more for the meal and some centers pay less, and they get reimbursed at a lower amount. So, so hopefully in this so model a, budget, it, yeah, that, there's, that will there's be room for improvement, and there is something that we're going to uh, prioritize at the department to try to fix some of those situations. And some of it is about efficiencies and our um, inability to hold programs accountable in the way that we'd like to. So we n definitely need to, to do something about that, and we've already started to do that. Will we see something in the executive budget that reflects the, the meal cost adjustments? As I said, we're, we've re-engaged with that, and it's something that we're working on. It's a work in progress, so it will be in the future. Do you have a timeline? How far in the future? <laughs> in my lifetime. <laughs> oh, that's too far. Because <laughs> you're going to live a in long In my tenure as life. commissioner. No, we definitely, because the providers are here. I mean, we need to as get I that said, problem solved. As I said, we've already engaged with, um, with the Office of Management and Budget, and those conversations are ongoing. And that is, they, you know, there is a commitment that this will be f phase two of the model senior center budget. So we will address the food component in the future. Okay, and we're gonna continue to make sure we push so that that future is sooner rather than later. Um, you know, we have um, a time uh, pressure here because one o'clock, uh, the education committee is having their budget hearing. And we wanna hear from the providers, and so we will follow up with the Commissioner and Department of Aging with all the questions that we didn't get the answer to, but I think that the issue with the model budget, we really need to see a more comprehensive presentation of it. And I think also the provider and the public also want to see how do we get to, what kind of formula uh, did OMB and DIFTA use to come up with this model budget to make sure that it is you know, fair and equitable among all the senior center. So we want to make sure that we get that information and we can share it with the public. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you for being thank here. You. And we will continue the negotiation. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you.
Uh, for the public that's testifying, sorry that I have to put you on the clock because we want to make sure everyone get a chance to speak. So there'll be a clock for two minutes. So give us your important points that we can follow up with the administration and with DIFTA. So first up, we have um, Rachel McCullen, uh, Bobby Sackman from the New York Caring Majority Coalition, uh, Molly Kukrowski from JASA, Chris Wadello from AARP, and Andrea Siafani from Live On New York. Are you ready? We're ready. Yes, please begin. <laughs> Thank you. Good m almost afternoon. Um, thank you so much, uh, Council Chair Chin, as well as uh, Council Member Deutsch and the rest of the Aging Committee that was here earlier to, for this opportunity to testify today at this very important hearing. Um, we also really would like to acknowledge the leadership um, of the Council last year, and especially you, Chair Chin, and the Year of the Senior, and all of the work to secure um, the uh, very historic investment in senior services um, more than we've seen in decades. So we're really happy Happy to be here today to talk about that and to talk about continuing to build upon that work. We also strongly recognize the important work um, through uh, DIFTA and the Commissioner Corrado, as well as the Mayor and the entire City Council for their work and leadership. Live on New York represents 100 community-based agencies serving over 300,000 older adults annually. Uh, and we know that these organizations are doing incredible work in every corner of this city to, to serve older adults, caregivers, and their families. Uh, we also know that aging creates momentum. We are all part of that today, and you can witness that every hearing you come to in the aging committee where you see hundreds of seniors um, here to listen and weigh in on the important services and what's going on in the city. So we're very proud to be here and, and be part of that. Aging, as we know, also creates challenges, which we, you know, can put the whole system at risk. The lack of fair funding that you've been very vocal about, and we appreciate that, the less than 1% um, of the city budget, creates challenges for both older adults their families as well as the organizations that are serving seniors. Um, there's also issues of ageism and, and you, we're working to combat that every day. And even with the historic gains, which we really appreciate in the budget last year, um, there still exists wait lists and staff turnover and there are issues with the system that we need, that's why we're here today, to continue to work together to build that. The good news for the future is that we have an incredible network of senior services here in New York City that um, working together with the council and the city are part of that solution and can serve seniors today and in the future. When we talk about the future of aging services, we include every person in every council district because they're all served, whether it be today or for the future for ourselves and our families. So I know that I got the bell, but I'm going to just quickly run through our um, priorities, which are fully listed in our testimony. Um, Regarding the Model Senior Center budget, as we sit here, centers are getting notifications about um, the influx of the first $10 million for staffing and programming. We recognize that as a very positive first step. Um, we're very happy to see that that is working, and we are encouraging that second $10 million that was referenced today be expedited and put into those budgets by um, FY20. It's really important to build up that system before the um, projected RFP. We also want to bring attention to the NYCHA Senior Centers. There's near 100 in the portfolio that are also through NYCHA that need some significant investment, so we really highlight those as well as needing for funding. 
Um, we, one of the main most important things about the model budget is that it didn't include food costs, and so we have um, a priority focused on raising the reimbursement rate for um, one dollar for both home delivered and congregate meals. Um, we also draw attention to the wait lists that still exist for both home care and case management, and we have asks for those as well. Um, and a continued investment and a thank you to council for your investment in all Schedule C um, senior services and a restoration for that as well. So thank you again for letting me talk a little longer and um, I know the, the hearing will continue and be, be wonderful. So thank you for your support and we, we look forward to working with you all. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's Molly Kurkowski from JASA and I want to thank um, Councilmember Chin for chairing today's hearing and um, Councilmember Deutsch and, and the committee. Um, I will jump straight into our um, main asks um, while recognizing the significant funding that you put in um, this past year and specifically your commitment to the human services sector. Um, w the way we see it, um, you know, fully funding city contracts and um, the social service sector um, is it's inextricably related and linked to our aging asks. Um, so salary equity. Um, as the city continues to right size budgets, JAS is looking for a targeted fun uh, focus on implementing increases in salaries for all DIFTA funded contracts. Um, some of this will be resolved in the, um, the senior center model budgets, but that doesn't address NORC programs, caregiver programs, and other DIFTA contracts that remain significantly underfunded. Um, culturally appropriate uh, home delivered and congregate meals. I'm gonna echo what Andrea just said. Um, last year, JASA served 702,000 um, plus home delivered meals, 57% of which were kosher meals. Um, and um, as a result, are projecting a deficit of $157,000 for providing those contracted meals through the city. Um, their last real increase was in um, FY15, and we need to see real investment in funding for the congregate and the home delivered meals. Um, the council initiatives, again, echoing um, what Andrea just mentioned, which is that uh, all senior programs rely heavily on discretionary asks through the Support Our Seniors, uh, Healthy Aging, NORC initiatives, et cetera, and we just want to make sure that that funding remains or that there's more funding put into contracts. You know, the, the money in the discretionary asks is really making up for the lack of funding in the contracts. Um, and I just wanted to, I won't, uh, you have it in front of you, but I did want to just piggyback on what Councilmember Deutsch asked earlier having to do with homeless services. I just did a quick look online. Um, but you know, there's 2% of the homeless population um, may be listed as seniors, but the largest number of homeless in, this, in the system, um, it's more than 30% are the 45 to 64 year olds. So we all know who those people are and they're the older adults. Um, and they're the older adults of five years down the road. So um, I just, I, I think we need to, um, echoing what, um, what Councilmember Rose and Deutsch are talking about, but this needs to be a real um, focus. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rachel McCullough. I'm the Director of Organizing at Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, and I'm the Campaign Director of the New York Caring Majority. The New York Caring Majority is a new coalition of seniors, people with disabilities, family caregivers, home care workers, and domestic workers from all across the state. We're advocating for a more sustainable and just caring economy to help all New Yorkers who give and receive care to live fuller and healthier lives. So we're here today to really just reinforce and back up everything that Andrea and Molly have already shared, especially regarding the urgent need to address the waiting list for both case management and home care. Our, uh, we're a statewide coalition, and so we're really leading these efforts at in Albany, where we wish that there were the same level of commitment and leadership that we see um, on behalf uh, or from, from Council Member Chin and from this committee. Uh, that's especially why when we do advocacy at the city level, we're especially pushing for even greater levels of boldness, creativity, and innovation. And so would applaud the year of the senior and the effort to make every year the year of the senior. 
Uh, beyond that, our coalition was part of the creation of the new division of paid care within the Office of Labor Policy and Standards. And uh, in the year ahead, we very much hope that there can be greater levels of collaboration and, and cooperation between DIFTA and that new division of paid care to lay the groundwork for the future of care and the future of care work in this city. Um, beyond that, I think we're very focused on the home care workforce shortage that is affecting folks statewide and exists here in the city as well. And um, Albany is not leading on that, and I think there is a great deal that New York City could do to invest in this fast-growing workforce that's overwhelmingly made up of women and women of color. Thank you. Hi. I could say good afternoon. Hi. My name is Bobby Sackman, formerly of Live on New York. I'm working with Rachel McCullough at the New York Caring Majority Coalition. I'm also involved with a group called the Radical Age Movement, which I'll come back to in a moment. Again, I, I'm, I'm here to also reinforce everything the Aging Advocates Coalition has asked for, and I was sitting here thinking, what a different time to look at all this money and the plans, and we know government doesn't move quickly or always well, but at least there's something in the pipeline and more work to be done. So kudos to you, Councilwoman, and, and to the whole sector. Um, the reason I'm involved with the New York Caring Majority Coalition is that they're talking about ICEP issues. They're talking about all these issues through the lens of racial and economic justice. And I think that that's something that we could all raise more. We know it's there, but I'm, I'm not sure we've raised it enough. And, and it's, it's critical. The, the only other thing I wanted to mention is um, the Radical Age Movement on May 15th is going to have the first New York City, and we think nationally, age justice rally. It's going to be at Union Square at 5 o'clock. We have a website, Radical Age Movement, or contact me. And one of the issues is a fair share of the city budget and how miserably overall we do for the Department for the Aging. So we will welcome everybody to come and, and bring older adults with them and, and join with us. We'll be doing more outreach. Um, so that's really all I wanted to add today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, AARP. <laughs> Chris. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Chin. Uh, my name is Chris Fidello. I'm the Associate State Director for AARP here in New York. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, and uh, hello to my AARP uh, members and friends in the audience. Uh, we're here on behalf of the 800,000 AARP members that are here in New York City, and I don't have to tell you that this is a very rapidly aging population. As a matter of fact, by the year 2040, uh, people 50 and older will c comprise about 20% uh, of, the of the population of the city, and of those 65 and older, it will make up 40%. Uh, so this is rapidly happening, happening. It's coming to a city uh, near you very soon. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, when you look at uh, multicultural communities that are aging, um, you know, we have a very diverse community here and in New York City, and they account for 62% uh, of New York City residents 50 and older. And half of those 65 plus living here in New York City were foreign born which is, I think, a very interesting statistic. Um, you know, when I think about the face of aging, you have our formal comments, and we want to echo the uh, priorities around uh, home care case management, uh, NORCs, uh, congregate and home delivered meals, and expedited funding for the model senior center uh, budget. Um, you know, I have to look no further than the, the folks that I see on my right, our members, who are uh, incredibly uh, independent, they're uh, civically engaged, uh, they're diverse, uh, and they're uh, very uh, part of the fabric of their communities. And when they think about aging, I'm sure that many of them want to stay here where they grew up, where they live now, where they've spent a, a large portion of their life. Um, if I ask them, do you, are you looking forward to eventually getting to a nursing home or some type of institutional care? I don't see many people raising their hand and waving this time around, right? So it's important that we have a strong department for the aging to provide these services that keep people healthy and in their home and community, and also make sure that they, that the Department for Aging leads the way on other initiatives across the state, to, uh, city to show other departments what they need to be doing to prepare for this big demographic change. 
One of the other issues I just briefly want to talk ab about is uh, ARP and the Public Utility Law Project has been very concerned about the 50 plus population and their ability to afford utilities. 41% um, of New Yorkers across the state have problem paying their bills and Con Edison continues to shut people off from their utilities at record rates, um, averaging over 5,000 people a month. Um, that means people are without power and those are, those are accounts, right? So each account is about three to four people. So there are thousands of people that are being impacted. We need leadership uh, from the council, from the administration, and I think maybe direction from DIFTA on how we can educate people on what their rights are, their options, and how they can avoid this because there's no reason during especially cold winter months that people are without power um, when uh, they have certain rights that they need to be aware of because some of these shuts up, shut offs are not, uh, are, are shouldn't be happening during certain months. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for your great work and, and bringing you know, your members here, Chris, uh, and for all the advocates who are here. Definitely we have a lot more to do. I mean, DIFTA, we got to make sure that it has a strong budget. Uh, it's like one of the smallest agencies. Even uh, the DYCD, the, the Department for Youth and Community Development, they have doubled their budget. So we still got a long way to go, and I'm really looking forward to continue to working with all of you to make that year of the senior every year. Okay, thank you. The next panel, Kevin Douglas and uh, Liz Short, uh, Shortwards from, sorry if I messed up your name, United Neighborhood Houses, um, Asia. Asia Bhakti from uh, New York Academy of Medicine, Rachel Sherrill from City, City Meals on Wheels, and Katie Foley, Self-Help Community Services. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Rachel Sherrill, Associate Executive Director at City Meals on Wheels. You oh, you want to wait a minute? So, oh, sure. Uh, thank you again to all the seniors who came today. Have a wonderful lunch. And we'll see you at the rallies because we've still got a lot of work to do to make sure we have a good budget this year for the year of the senior. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know who we are, City Meals. You know what we do. I just want to emphasize that we stand with the other advocates in the Aging Coalition, obviously, to support a stronger DIFTA. Evidence does support the fact that in-home services and programs like Meals on Wheels allow ad older adults to age in place. We do know that they don't want to be institutionalized. Um, DIFTA's budget for last fiscal year, fiscal 17, actually reflected an increase of 25% since the mayor did take over, but that brings us back to 2008 levels. Even with the wonderful increase that you were able to secure last year, we need to make sure that we have more money. Uh, during that time, the population increased 9%, and as we heard from everybody else, we know that it's um, rapidly increasing. Uh, we need to support all the, uh, everything that was said before me to improve capacity by funding costs for operations within aging services as well as aging NYCHA facilities where many of our seniors go to socialize and eat and get benefits and entitlements. We're also asking for an increase in meals and the reimbursement costs for both home delivered and congregate as we know that will not get them to fully funded contracts, but at least it's a jump start. We haven't had an increase in years, and obviously there have been cost of living, food cost, and the wage increases that were mandated, which are wonderful for staffing, but put a lot of pressure on the providers. So we're here to support you, whatever you need, um, to make sure that DIFTA has more money. Thank you, Councilmember Chen. My name is Asia Badi. I'm a senior policy associate at the New York Academy of Medicine. The Academy applauds the City Council's commitment to support older adults through the Department for the Aging. The Academy encourages the City Council to provide sufficient support to the Commission and Secretariat for Age Friendly NYC. As the older adult population in the city continues to grow in size and diversity of demands, a strong network of public private partnerships is more important than ever before to meet that, their growing needs. Age Friendly NYC offers a point of connection, collaboration, and oversight between public and private sector initiatives and advocates for age-inclusive policy and amenities across all aspects of life. 
Age Friendly NYC is uniquely positioned and admired for its effective collaborative work across the sectors, transportation, arts and culture, public spaces and housing, and its quest to improve health and quality for all older New Yorkers. A critical focus of Age Friendly NYC is its work to prevent social isolation and increase inclusion of older adults throughout the city. Older people in New York City may be at greater risk for social isolation due to higher rates of living alone, poverty, mobility impairments, and lack of English proficiency. Social connection is not only good for health, but also a priority for older people. According to a national survey, 40% stated, said, stated connect, staying connected with friends and family was most important. Senior centers are an important part of the solution. However, a majority of older adults wish to participate in multi-generational environments and continue the activities that they've done all their lives. Age Friendly NYC supports inclusion of older adults by hearing from older people and then working with local leaders and stakeholders to eliminate barriers to engagement, and including bi businesses, arts and culture, and parks and libraries. There's a continued need to spread and sustain the city's age-friendly policies, and as the council considers how we should support all older adults in New York City, the Academy respectfully recommends baselining and adequate support of age-friendly NYC, including the Secretariat and activities of the Commission. The Academy is pleased to serve as a resource, and we look forward to working with the council to make all of our neighborhoods healthier and age-friendly for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Katie Foley and I am the new director of- Put the mic closer to you, please. Okay. How's that? My name is Katie Foley and I'm the new director of public affairs at Self-Help Community Services. Thank you to aging committee chair Margaret Chin and to the members of the committee this morning for the opportunity to testify today. As you know, Self-Help is committed to ensuring the independence and dignity of older New Yorkers as they age through a range of home and community-based programs. We're grateful for the Council's ongoing support for so many important senior programs, and today I want to focus on two of Self-Help's priorities, the rest are in the written testimony, that we hope the Council will highlight over the next few months and in budget negotiations. We commend the Department for the Aging and the City Council for the ongoing commitment to senior centers since the beginning of the model budget process. We're grateful to receive the notice about the fiscal year 18 and 19 allocations and the enhancements the city is providing to our centers. We believe that this is the first step in the process that will enhance one of the core programs that supports older New Yorkers, including many immigrant seniors. We hope that additional investments in the next few years will move us toward the goal of right-sizing staffing resources, rent and food costs, and expanding programming to meet client needs. Our five senior centers serve over 10,000 people and continue to be understaffed given the significant need from our community and the high quality programming that our centers offer. We are also urging the City Council to renew the Holocaust Survivor Initiative with continued support for self-help and our Holocaust Survivor Program. More than 50% of the survivors served by self-help are living at or below the poverty line, while 80% of survivors from the former Soviet Union are living in poverty. As the largest provider of comprehensive services to survivors, self-help is uniquely positioned to assist this last generation of survivors, especially as their needs grow more intense and more costly. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Additional information, like I said, about self-help's priorities and programs can be found in my written testimony. And behalf, on behalf of the 20,000 clients we serve, I am grateful for the Council's support on so many important programs. Um, thank you for convening your hearing today. My name is Liza Schwartzwald. I'm here with Kevin Douglas representing United Neighborhood Houses. Um, UNH is the association of 39 settlement houses within the city. There's over 650 sites uh, collectively serving over 750,000 New Yorkers, including 70,000 older adults in programs like senior centers, NORCs, home delivered meals, and a multitude of other programs. Um, we would first like to thank the City Council, and in particular, Chair Chin, for all of the leadership you've provided in the last few years, especially last year's Year of the Senior. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to revisit some of those priorities. Uh, today I'll be talking about the Senior Center model budget process, and you can also find some of our other priorities, uh, NYCHA-based DIFTA Senior Centers, Home Delivered Meals, and the restoration or expansion of several of the Council initiatives, NORC's Geriatric Mental Health, Support Our Seniors and Healthy Aging, and our written testimony. 
Um, so again, we'd like to thank the city uh, for beginning to address the chronic underfunding of senior centers by investing $10 million in the model budget process. This was a great step in the right direction. Um, we would like to mention a few challenges we've had with the process. Um, first, the city hasn't been as transparent in its development of the process as we would have liked. Um, as we are echoing others, um, the model budget hasn't covered key cost drivers such as rent, food, and OTPS costs. And the delay in getting instructions to providers, uh, which I believe were just sent out this week for FY18 contracts, may not give time to access and um, spend that money. Um, so to that end, we have a couple of recommendations. Uh, we would like to recommend that first the city ensure that DIFTA has the infrastructure and, me uh, infrastructure and mechanisms in place to execute the $10 million in contract amendments, uh, that the city invest $4.5 million in FY19 to address the congregate meals that aren't covered, um, that the city include the second $10 million promised for DIFTA's budget as soon as possible but no later than 2020, and that DIFTA more closely work with providers and advocates on this budget going forward. So again, you can find our other priorities um, in our written testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon, Chair Chin. I just wanted to add a couple of items that are sort of a little bit broader picture beyond DIFTA's budget alone. We echo everything that everyone has said here today, but we think it's really important that the City Council recognize that many of the flaws in the DIFTA contracting process are systemic to the whole city at large. And so we're part of a broad continuum of social service providers in the city who are really asking City Council to hold the administration to account on fairly funding contracts across the board. We're recommending that the city adopt principles in all contracting for human services that provide at least a 15% indirect rate and a 37% fringe rate, which would include an allowance for health insurance. And then we're also recommending straight increases to occupancy costs, casualty and liability insurance of 10% each. We estimate that this could cost in the neighborhood of $200 million, but we're really looking for the city as the holder of all contract information to work with the council and advocates to understand what that true cost is and to implement it as soon as possible. We think it's important that we undergird the system at large and not sort of do sort of one-offs here and there to try to fix parts of contracts and parts of agencies, but we really take a systemic look to fixing the solution or the problem. Thank you. Thank you. You have that in the testimony, so we will follow up. Great. Thank you for all your great work and uh, thank you for being here today. We're gonna call up the next panel. Uh, Packy Kane from the St Stanley Isaac Neighborhood Center, Tanya Krupak from the Osborne Association, uh, Barbara Brown, New York Road Runners, and uh, Sakia Haywood, also from New York Road Runner, and uh, uh, Jeanette Estima from uh, FPWA. You want to begin? All right. Good afternoon, Chair Chen. My name is Zakia Haywood, and I serve as the Director of Community Services at New York Road Runners. I've been with the organization for about 12 years. And thank you for this opportunity to testify before the Committee on Aging for the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget. I'm here to speak on how New York Road Runners provides the motivation, know-how, and opportunity for people of all ages and abilities to truly run for life. For us, every year is the year of the senior. While New York Road Runners is best known for producing the TCS New York City Marathon and our free youth programs in schools, our, our organization is a dedicated provider of senior health and fitness programs throughout New York City. Maintaining and increasing access to health and fitness services is imperative for the well-being of our city's older adults. 
The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recognizes physical activity and physical education as critical for both preventing and treating many chronic conditions. Additionally, walking programs such as our Striders program and walkable communities are good for social connectivity, good for business, good for the environment, and most importantly, an easy way to help seniors enjoy a better quality of life and live longer independently. With that said, New York Roadrunners respectfully ask the New York City Council to consider our request to support our Striders program through the Healthy Aging Initiative. Currently, the Striders program, which started in 2011 in a response to the New York City Department of Health Community Needs Assessment for Health Equity Programming for Older Adults, operates in 49 New York City Council districts. We received generous support from the council during the past two budget years under the Healthy Aging Initiative. And with the 2019 request, we are hoping to, one, continue to provide the organized program via a healthy neighborhood hub model um, for 3,000 seniors, to continue to work with the New York City Department for the Aging on walking 101 workshops and technical assistance in senior centers, and to also expand our discovery walk series um, through the mayor's Building Healthy Communities Initiative in East Harlem and other communities. Uh, we look forward to continuing our commitment with the New York City's aging population and growing relationship with the New York City Council. Thank you for allowing us to testify today. Good afternoon, Chair Chin. My name is Barbara Brown. I am a New York Roadrunner Strider, a senior, a senior citizen from Brooklyn, New York, and a proud runner. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Whoever said you cannot teach an old dog new tricks is incorrect. I am a prime example of all, all with support. At any age, you can do anything you set your mind and heart to do. I am a 65-year-old and proud, and I try to live life the fullest potential every day. However, one day I went, I went, I was recently retired, and I went to the doctor and was surprised when he gave me a list of chronic illnesses I suffered from, an even longer list of medication. I needed to take some, some of which he told me I will have to take for the entire, my entire life. And that mo at that moment, I knew I would have to make a change in my life. I, if I was going to be proud, if I was going to be around for my children and grandchildren and see, the, see, the, see them experience a special mind, milestone in their life. I joined a local New York City Park Recreation Center and learned how to swim. Um, this was my, um, I'm sorry about that. Then I joined a local senior center with a fixed income, I needed free activities to be social and get out of the house. The Albany Neighborhood Senior Center in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, provided a number of opportunities to chat and be creative, but at the same time did not offer physical activity. That changed, that changed when Coach Maria from the New York Roadrunner Strider Program came to our senior center and didn't want to hear, she said, I didn't want to hear excuses. She told me we were all athletes and whoever and whenever we are, we must get up and walk. Okay. I became an athlete runner. I purchased a Fitbit and beat most weekly challenges. I love the challenge. I participated in another community program from Roadrunner called Open Run at Canarsie. The Strider program from New York Roadrunner changed my life for the better. My health was improved greatly in the three years I've been participating. And I, and, and, and I, know, and I know that it has added years to my life. Um, Mr. Um, Chair Chin, I humbly ask you to support the work of New York Roadrunners so that most seniors across New York City, just like me, can be touched by your free health programs. Thank you for, for allowing me to testify today. You're welcome. Oh, you're happy. Yeah, try to. <laughs> yes. So 
a hard act to follow. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Tanya Krupat. I'm from the Osborne Association. The Osborne Association provides a wide range of, diver of diversion and reentry programs at sites in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Harlem, and Newburgh, New York, as well as services at 27 New York State prisons and seven New York City jails. My testimony focuses on older adults returning from incarceration. Today, there are more than 10,337 people over age 50 in New York State prisons. Each year, more than 1,000 men and women age 50 and over leave state prison and return to New York City. We want to thank the City Council, your leadership, and particularly Council Member Drum for recently passing the CARE Act, which establishes a temporary interagency task force examining the needs of older adults post-incarceration. This is an exciting and important step forward, and we hope the task force will begin to meet soon. My written testimony provides greater detail about the program we're seeking City Council funding for in the amount of 150,000. The program, the Elder Reentry Initiative, provides case management and support for returning elders in New York City. But I want to tell you a true story that illustrates the challenges reentering elders face. Larry spent much of the last 40 years since age 17 in and out of prisons and jails. Elder Reentry staff picked him up on his release date last November, and he has been involved in Osborne ever since. He's a daily fixture in our classes and substance abuse treatment program, and he's working on getting an apartment. Larry had no friends or family when he left prison at almost age 60, so his housing options were limited. He wanted long-term sustainable housing, and he wanted to get there by sleeping at a shelter long enough to be granted a housing voucher, which he'd used to rent a room while he worked and saved enough money to get his own apartment. With Osborne's help, he'd been navigating the bureaucracy, but just as he was ready to sign a lease on a room with his hard-earned voucher, a housing specialist made an error and put the wrong room number on the lease. This careless error cascaded into a potentially cataclysmic couple of hours for Larry. He believed he'd have to start over, a process that had taken several months already. I'm almost done. The night before, police had raided the shelter, which caused him to be very scared. Instead of spiraling out of control, he met with his care manager for hours, and he said, you've always got my back. I've never had that. We are happy to report that five days later, Larry moved into his own room and is working on the next step of his plan, saving for an apartment. Thank you for your consideration and support of those like Larry. Thank you, Councilmember Chin and members of the Committee on Aging. My name is Paki Kane. I'm part of the Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center as the Deputy Executive Director. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be on this side of the table. Um, you know our organization well, so I, I won't go through all of it, but we are part of a NORC. Um, our senior center offers congregate meals, a multitude of wellness activities, um, pro, uh, media and technology classes, arts and cultural entertainment. We also have a comprehensive case management program that provides seniors with supports and services they need to comfortably and safely age in place. Um, I want to thank the members of the committee as well as Commissioner Corrado for their much needed attention to budgets um, of the senior centers. As we know, the muddle budget process has added $10 million. I won't repeat some of the things that others have said here, but I, will, I would like to highlight that that $10 million is across the entire system. Specifically for our organization, it, it translated to approximately $36,000 um, for fiscal 17 and fiscal 18. Oh, sorry, fiscal 18, fiscal 19. And it's important to note that the allocation is restricted to personnel costs and programming. So that means instructors um, and consultants. So other than personnel costs like rent, utilities, supplies, and even meal costs are not included as discussed um, at this hearing. We appreciate the commissioner's commitment to negotiate additional allocations for organizations such as ours on a case-by-case -case basis. But as we know, the expanding needs of the rapidly growing aging population in NYC require a substantial commitment Councilmember Chen, your work with the Speaker and the Council's budget negotiating team to ensure continued critical funding for NORCs and also other citywide initiatives that you have been a leader in supporting, such as support our seniors and senior centers programs and enhancements, is critical to our work. Um, these, in, these investments allow the Isaac Center to provide hundreds of older adults per year with access to services that pr provide financial security, support their health and wellness, and ensure the stability of their housing. These efforts provided by interdisciplinary teams of social workers, nurses, psychotherapists, and program specialists maximize their potential um, to age in place safely and comfortably. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Hello, my name is Jeanette Estima, and I'm a senior policy analyst at FPWA, an anti-poverty policy and advocacy organization. 
with a membership network of 170 community and faith-based members. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Chin and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak here today. Last year, thanks to your leadership, the administration started to turn the tide on decades of chronic underfunding for aging services. We're so grateful to the City Council and the administration for such a clear demonstration of their commitment to older New Yorkers with nearly 23 million in baseline funding. That was a critical first step in rebuilding the safety net for older New Yorkers. We now ask that the Council fight to further stabilize funding, not only to meet current needs, but also to shore up the city's safety net infrastructure for older adults, which is threatened by proposed federal cuts. According to our analysis, Trump's budget proposal cuts DIFTA's federal funding by nearly $27 million, or 7.2%. Uh, These cuts are in addition to the decimation of direct federal assistance, such as housing, food assistance, and health care. Especially now, under this threat, a continued city-led investment in a long-term plan to build this service in infrastructure is the right way forward. In FY19, we encourage the council to seek an investment of $22.1 million for services that help keep older New Yorkers in their communities. Of particular importance this year is funding for both congregate and home-delivered meals, neither of which have received an increase in several years. Current reimbursement rates are below the national average. Therefore, we request that per meal reimbursements be increased by a dollar at a total cost of $12.1 million in FY19. Also, there are nearly 100 DIFTA-funded senior centers located within NYCHA developments. While these centers will receive some funding for staff and programming through the model budget process, these centers have unique needs as a result of budget shortfalls at NYCHA. In order to make these centers safe, inviting spaces, we request $10 million over two years. Uh, there are still older New Yorkers on wait lists for case management and home care, as you know, so we're requesting $2 million for case management and $1 million for home care. Uh, to ensure that these services keep pace with the ever-increasing demand. Um, and finally, we just wanted to echo the um, other advocates in asking that, um, the, that you ensure that uh, DIFTA has the capacity necessary to process all of the amendments um, as they roll out the model budget, the $20 million. Um, we really want to see these be expedited as well, um, and we're hoping that it's fully implemented by FY20, not FY21. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. We're on the same page. We want to make sure that that money gets out to the providers. Thank you. We're going to call up the next panel. Um, Joanne Yu from the Asian American Federation. Dr. Cynthia Morrow from uh, vi uh, Visiting Neighbors. Lashman uh, from India, home. You got to pronounce your name for me again. <laughs> and John Reeves from uh, Staten Island AARP. Vicki Owen from uh, the 12th District of Council Member Andy King. And Bonnie Luma Lumaji from Educational Alliance. I know Bonnie. <laughs> Come on up. Please begin. Sorry. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Councilwoman Chin, for this opportunity. My name is Joanne Yu, and I'm the Executive Director of the Asian American Federation. We represent an organization of almost 70 nonprofits that serve the Asian American community. Um, we're here to offer our support for programs that serve our senior community population. As you know, Asian American seniors are the fastest growing in New York City, and um, they are not just living in enclaves, but they are living in all boroughs, in all neighborhoods. And certainly, um, we know from the reports that we have su submitted to this um, council and to you specifically, how much uh, the support they are not getting. So um, just as a, a highlight, I just want to mention that um, one in four Asian seniors live in poverty, with poverty rates reaching as high as 35% for Bangladeshi seniors and 30% for Chinese seniors. 
Language barriers remain high for uh, Asian American seniors. For example, more than 90% of Chinese and Korean speaking um, Korean seniors have limited English proficiency and among Bangladeshi speakers, 88% were limited English profession. Um, as you know, um, seniors tend to um, want to go to services where um, their languages, language is spoken and their culture is um, practiced and readily accepted. And so I, my recommendations, I have a detailed report and I brought some senior reports that we um, produced last year, but I want to offer our recommendations that we need to increase funding to expand senior services for Asian American seniors. Certainly, I think while um, City Council has, uh, DIFTA has done a remarkable job getting the funds out, we still have a huge need. Um, granted that we come from a point of deficit. Um, I'd like to ask the City Council to ensure that DIFTA receives the funding they need to fully implement the new citywide language access law, that, um, the local law 30, and to also talk about mental health and to be able to support that. Um, as you know, um, in New York City, Asian seniors are the only population where su suicide is within the top 10 percent, top 10 cause of death, leading cause of death, and so um, this is a huge issue for us, and there's such a stigma about talking about depression and suicide in our community and so social isolation, so we really do need to address this issue. Um, additionally, I know time is up. Additionally, um, we need to talk about um, homebound meals. I know that we've everybody has talked about that here, and I, I see our member agencies here. I see Pauline and I, Lakshman and um, Mo, uh, here, but um, we don't have a Meals on Wheels program on our own. We are always subcontracting, and so I think it's high time that we get one. There isn't any reason that one of our larger Asian American nonprofits um, can manage a, can man, manage one for the city. And um, you know they are at the whims of the, the big agencies. There is no way to compete. But we d really do need to figure out how to disaggregate some of the funding that com comes to our community. And finally, um, we need to start to think about the census. I know that this is the um, something that we have been worried about, but we know that um, s seniors are particularly vulnerable to bad information, and um, there is so much fear in our community that we'd like to put this on the radar for this committee and for you as well, so that that way we can all figure out how do we start to inform our sen seniors about the importance of census and participation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chin, for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Lakshman Kalaspudi. I'm from India Home. Um, and you are familiar with India Home, uh, and <laughs> you've been telling us to come and testify, and that's what we've been doing. <laughs> and um, we're happy uh, and that- And you've also been getting uh, support from the city council, right? Yes, of So course. testifying <laughs> helps. Um, and we're happy to see the increase in the DIFTA budget um, for FY 2018. Um, and we're happy that all our partner agencies, such as Queens Community House and Sunnyside Community Services, have received that. I increase. But we must note that despite our continued advocacy, grassroots community-led organizations such as India Home and others in this room uh, have not received the benefits of the uh, increased baseline budget. Um, we serve a cr critical gap in serving multi in a multiply vulnerable population who are immigrants, LEP, and low income. And we're laying the foundation for services that will only be increasing in demand in the coming years. In fact, just yesterday, um, despite there being a foot on, of snow on the ground, we've got 50 seniors at our Desi Senior Center. Um, and we're trying to be creative on how best to ne meet their needs. Um, we started in 2008, and our most lar lar largest senior center, Desi Senior Center, with over 100 Bangladeshi seniors, was started in 2014. But DIFTA recently proposed that the next senior center contract will start July 1st, in 2021. We cannot wait three more years. Um, we cannot, our communities cannot be shortchanged, and all we're asking for is equity and resource allocation and distribution. Um, in, until 2021, uh, there have to be provisions um, in the increased baseline budget for programs such as us that were who are not in the RFP system, and I'm asking you to you know get creative about it, and I'm asking DIFTA to get creative about it, and because we're trying to get as creative as we can, uh, and um, yeah, we thank you for your leadership, and we are heavily relying on your council initiatives to fund our programs, but uh, you know the support only runs so far, so thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia Mauer with Visiting Neighbors. 
We're here to talk about a population that often isn't included, and that is the population not going to the senior centers. The seniors that can't get out or don't want to or honestly are looking to make a connection with someone who's youthful and engage in going, ongoing activities. We're also targeting the seniors that are the oldest old. In this city, we right now currently are serving a thousand seniors for our little group. I really do think of us like the engine that could. We've done a lot with very little, but we still need something. And we're very thankful for discretionary funds. If it wasn't for discretionary funds, we couldn't do the work that we do. What do we do? We have volunteers who are on the front lines who are serving our seniors by taking them to doctors, being an arm to hold, safely cross the street. I had a discussion with some volunteers the other day, young students, to say, look around you on the street. Notice how many people are on their cell phones who don't get off their cell phones, who bump into you. And one student came back in, 17, said, you know, there was at least seven people in a very short uh, few feet all on the phone. So a lot of times seniors are knocked over. There are hazards, potholes, getting around. Being an advocate when someone goes into a hospital, just having somebody let the staff know that there's somebody watching can make the difference of being more and more careful and just letting them know that they're not alone. Having, celebrating a 100th birthday, we have 12 seniors this year who are going to turn 100. And these people are at home, and they want to stay in their own homes, because you would too. And if we're lucky, we'll all become a healthy senior someday, but not without programs like Visiting Neighbors in place. Volunteer programs like ours are cost effective, they make sense, they help a lot of people, and the cost of a nursing home for seniors in a nursing home would pay for our entire program, keeping 1,000 people okay. There are all kinds of fraud issues out there. We're trying to keep people safe, keep them aware of what's going on so that they don't fall victim and prey. We need support, and we need to let people know that seniors that are going to senior centers are great. Those are fun programs, but there's also importance for, you know, a place for being valued in our society when people can't get there. And we just want to tell you thank you for getting it, we need you to help more people get it so that they understand that we need to be able to keep our people home and safe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bonnie Lumagi, and I'm the director of um, the Co-op Village NORC at the Educational Alliance. And I'm here to talk about NORCs because apparently it's not that, doesn't seem to be that on the forefront of the DIFTA budget to see the need to increase the funding for NORC programs. And there are significant reasons to do that because as my, um, this lovely lady here pointed out, not all seniors go to senior centers. Senior centers are extremely important and valued and valuable, but it, it doesn't stop there. There's a lot of seniors that need to be serviced in their homes and that is what the NORCs do and continue to do and many do without DIFTA funding and use discretionary funding and um, we're really being put to the brink here with the increased numbers because we are seeing more and more people age living longer, living longer with needs. So I strongly urge this committee to really, really look at why they're not increasing the funding for NORC programs because that's a, and, and the fact that the budget is so small for a very, very fastly growing population. Um, a couple of points that I just want to point out regarding NORCs. We're finding in recent years, like our, many have said already, that there's a rise in, in seniors living longer. Um, and we have many seniors that are over the age of 100. And come on, come in, in June, I'll in uh, August, I'll invite you. We have over 30 people a year that we're honoring that are over the age of 95. So, and, and those are the ones that are just coming out. Um, so there's definitely an, a strong increase of seniors living longer. And they need, we need to expand and diversify our program accordingly, which is causing budgetary strain because we're also working with people as young as 60. And, they, and a person at 60 doesn't necessarily have the needs or wants of a person at 100. Um, our health partners, this is a huge issue. The nursing component is to meet the deliverables that New York City Department of Aging requires, they can no longer provide the services without reimbursement. We need additional funds to continue to provide the vital nursing services we presently offer. These services enable faster identification of medical issues before it becomes critical and hospitalization is required. 
Further funding, we need the funding that the City Council provided in FY16 baseline in the budget. We also um, were being asked to collect data more and more, um, but, there, but DIFTA is not providing adequate um, support um, to manage this function. And we're working on very old computers, obsolete computers, and um, the mandate is just getting more and more. And, we're sp and, most, and a lot of times our social workers are spending more time at a computer than working with a client. Um, we're struggling to maintain qualified staff. Yes, it's wonderful that, that case management got the increase for MSWs. When is that increase gonna hit NORCs and, and other programs? 45,000 start for an MSW is laughable and no one's gonna take it. One year I lost three social workers because I can't, I can't do it. I keep talking about it, but nothing keeps happening. And it's really unfortunate because we need adequate staff to help the growing need. The need isn't getting less, the need's getting more. Um, again, I thank you for having us here today. I applaud this committee. You do so much with such little, and we appreciate it, but obviously more needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We know that, and that's why we got to make sure that this year's budget also gets increased. Well, thank you for being here. And our last panel. Uh, Miranda Hoffner from Lincoln Center, Ario. Uh, Saransky from UJA Federation, Alan Pothazer from uh, Brightwater Towers Tenant Association, and Sari Techman from Service Center, and Mohammed Razi from uh, Kobo Senior Center. Anybody else that wanted to testify that didn't sign up? Please Council. begin. Thank you. Council Member Chen and members of the Aging Committee. My name is Miranda Hoffner. I'm the Assistant Director of Accessibility at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, and we're also a member of the Cultural Institutions Group. On behalf of Lincoln Center and the CIG, we want to express our continued gratitude to the Council's longstanding leadership and support. In FY18, Lincoln Center was fortunate enough to receive a $51,500 grant from the Council's Geriatric Mental Health Initiative. We're here to request that the council continue funding this in FY19, and also to support CIG's request that you baseline the $10 million received in FY18 and an additional $20 million allocated for all cultural institutions, providing a means for implementing the city's cultural plan. One particularly vulnerable, vulnerable and isolated group within the senior population in New York City is individuals with dementia. It's estimated that over 5 million Americans are living with dementia, and that number is expected to triple by 2050. At Lincoln Center, we seek to combat the isolation and caregiver stress of the disease through Lincoln Center Moments, an arts program that focuses on community and self-expression. And FY18 will welcome 900 New Yorkers to performance-based programs, followed by music, movement, and art-making workshops. Bringing the outstanding talent of Lincoln Center stages to an intimate and supported setting, individuals with dementia and their caregivers can access world-class performances and workshops that foster discussion, self-expression, and socialization. For many participants, the arts are a central reason why they make New York their home, and this program aims to return that vital part to their lives. In the words of some of our participants, my mom does have Alzheimer's, but when she comes to Lincoln Center, she comes alive. I greatly enjoyed the experience as well. And the strength of the program cultivates the patient's imagination and helps them socially interact with others. This program has a unique cross-disciplinary approach blending the arts and social services. We're partnering with Caring Kind, the former Alzheimer's Association's New York chapter to train our staff, consult on supporting individuals and caregivers and reaching out to underserved New Yorkers and community centers. Through a study conducted by the Louis Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine last spring, the program has proven to have significant positive impacts on our participants in terms of elevated mood and connection to loved ones. Uh, New York Center is, uh, Lincoln Center is grateful to the council for generously granting um, the Council's Geriatric Mental Health Initiative last year, and we request uh, continued support in FY19. On behalf of Lincoln Center and the CIG, thank you so much for your support and consideration. Next, please. Alan Pottes of Brightwater Town. Can you press the button, please, Alan? Okay, I thought you could hear me loudest. Okay. Anyway, Alan Pottes from the Brightwater Tower Tenants Association and a retired attorney. I thank Councilwoman Chin, and I want to remark, I'm not asking for any money. I just want to make an observation like 
Councilman Deutsch said about the 2,000 homeless seniors. A lot of the reasons seniors are homeless is because they live in rent-stabilized apartments and rent-controlled apartments that are valuable. Landlords have done uh, started eviction proceedings against them for no basis just to get their apartments. And I realize there's some money in the budget, but not adequate. It doesn't really specify how much money in the budget to protect these seniors. I'm a senior myself, and I see this both as an attorney and as an individual. And also, the process servers serve papers that are not valid, and the judges do not observe this. How much oversight is the city council doing in this matter? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Arielle Sobranski. I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. On behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, UJA applauds the Council's continued interest and support of New York City seniors and the programs and services on which they rely. I guess one of the benefits of being on the last panel of the day is that most of what I've written in my testimony has already been mentioned, so I'm just going to echo a few of my colleagues' asks. Uh, first, I'd like to echo my colleagues and ask for the release of the remaining $10 million uh, proposed through the model budget process be expedited and fully allocated by FY20 as opposed to the proposed three-year rollout. Next, I'd like to echo my colleagues in the request to increase the reimbursement rates for home-delivered and congregant meals. UJA's network of nonprofit partners provides vital food services and supports to all New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs. It is also through our partners that UJA is the largest provider of kosher food in New York City. However, the high cost of a kosher meal presents a unique challenge for many of our agencies in their work with clients who observe these dietary laws. As was point, pointed out, there was an increased investment in FY15, which alleviated some of this burden, but providers of kosher meals continue to feel strained. We also just heard about NORCs on the last panel, so I will just echo my um, recommendation that the City Council increase the investment in NORCs for the valuable services that they provide to seniors. And the last thing I want to bring up that was also brought up previously is the Elie Wiesel Holocaust Survivor Initiative. UJA applauds the leadership of the City Council and its continued investment in New York City's Holocaust survivors. Many of our nonprofit partners have received initiative grants to provide specialized programming and comprehensive services for Holocaust survivors. As we continue to care for this last generation of survivors, we ask that the City Council continue its compassionate support of this vulnerable population and increase the investment to $3.5 million for the Holocaust Initiative. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so if you have my testimony in front of you, it says making history. Uh, there's a reason for that. My name is Mohammed Razvi. I am the executive director and CEO of Council of People's Organization. And we run the first and possibly the only halal senior center in New York City. I'm just cutting my presentation a little bit shorter. We service over 15,000 people in our office. And we are, I can't even explain to you, at the forefront of providing multiple services for the community, um, whether it's from pre-K classes to health insurance to English classes to voter registration and the senior center. COPA has been servicing the seniors for many years and it's come time to time when people come to us and they phone us and I thought it was you know, all good that I'm able to help these seniors but now we're receiving phone calls that seniors who are homebound who need the services what do I do? I had no idea what to do. So I called my friend, Joanne Yu, and I called DIFTA, the team of DIFTA that we were working with, and Commissioner Corrado. We had a meeting, and uh, I want to be the first one to let you know, I know you never heard of this. You've heard of Kosher Meals on Wheels, Catholic Charities Meals on Wheels, but this time, <laughs> so it's going to be the first Halal Meals on Wheels program. And this is only possible because, and I'll say it again, because the advocacy that we did, the community members, because of you, Ms. Chen, thank you so much, Margaret, and also because of the commissioner. There are over one million Muslims in New York City and growing. Many of them are seniors also. They've done their share, they've worked hard, 
They've raised their families. They've done everything that all other seniors have done. All I request is that resources be allocated accordingly. Let me and other groups like me serve my community. The Jewish community, the Christian community, yes, they do wonderful work and they are servicing their communities. Where is their resources for our communities, the Asian community, the Korean community? Let us have our own contracts. Thank you. Well, I wanted to thank you all for your great work and, and coming to testify today. This is, uh, once again, you know, we're going to be working hard to make sure DIFTA, Department for the Aging, get its fair share of the budget. Because our senior needs to be a priority, and every year needs to be the year of the senior. Um, Alan, I um, thank you for coming. We're doing a lot in senior council, uh, in the city council to protect senior, to make sure they can stay in their home. So if a senior is facing landlord harassment, they should call their council member and they can call 311. We have legal services, we have support services for them because we want to make sure they can age in the home, in the community that they help to build. Yes, <laughs> we all know that. That's why we're fighting for more. And thank you all for being here today uh, for the Council Committee on Aging. Council Member Doyle, do you want to say something? Yeah, sure. First of all, I'd like to recognize Alan Potheiser. He's a constituent of mine. Yes. And so is Bobby Sacklin. Um, and I just want to answer your question, the, the last, uh, I don't know your name, the, you just spoke on the panel. And I agree with you. And uh, in my district, I have what's called the Afna Center, which is a, a Muslim group that um, we're able to form a, a center for the Muslim community. And you're absolutely right. And um, this is the first year they will be getting city funding. And uh, we really, you know, no community should be disenfranchised from any city services, and as well as our seniors. So we brought a lot of resources into my district, into the, the, into the Muslim community. And I fully agree with what you have said. And also, we, we also need to fight uh, in the budget to uh, have in the one point, for the 1.1 million school children in the city to have a halal and kosher option. So this way, all school children uh, get the free lunches that uh, they deserve. So thank you. So let me know when can I testify for that. I will be there. Thank you. <laughs> it's going to be nice. Well, the next uh, committee hearing is uh, education. That's why we have, to, we have to wrap up. And thank you all for uh, coming to testify today. Uh, the budget hearing for FY19 for the Committee of Aging is now adjourned.